time enough to take a seat and we'll hear from members of the public. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce myself and my fellow commissioners and then uh, uh, tell you why we're here and how we intend to proceed this evening. Uh, my name is Michael Schmidt. I'm from Paintsville, Kentucky. I'm chairman of the Kentucky Public Service Commission. Seated to my right is Vice Chairman uh, Robert Matthews and to my left, Commissioner uh, Toledo. Robert Cicero, Commissioner Toledo Matthew Matthews. You see how confusing it is already. <laughs> anyway, we are uh, we're accompanied by several members of the Public Service Commission staff. They are Gwen Pinson, who is uh, our uh, Executive Director, Stephanie Schweigert, uh, Brenda Stith, Matt Baer, Jeb Penny, Andrew Melnikovich, and uh, Jim Rhodes. Uh, we're here for the purpose this evening of taking comments on the application of Kentucky Power Company for approval of an adjustment in rates and a certificate of public convenience and necessity. The case number is 2017-00179. If you were here for the earlier informational session, you heard about this application in greater detail and also received an explanation of how the Public Service Commission will go about reaching a decision in this case. If you missed the presentation, it's available on the PSC website, which is psc.ky.gov. This is the second of three public meetings the Public Service Commission is conducting to receive public comments in this matter. We held a meeting last Thursday in Prestonsburg and are holding one in Ashland on Wednesday. We understand that any matter that affects electric rates is likely to produce strong and differing opinions. We trust that everyone here this evening will present their comments in a respectful manner and respect the right of everyone to be heard. Now let me explain how we will proceed for the remainder of this event. We are here to listen to the public. Therefore, there will be no presentations by Kentucky Power or any of the other parties to this case, nor will there be any question and answer period involving the parties. The Commission will be taking sworn testimony from them in, forth in a forthcoming evidentiary hearing. Allowing questions and answers on the record as part of this meeting creates the potential for procedural problems later in that process. However, Representatives of Kentucky Power Company have agreed to remain after the conclusion of the public comments to meet informally with anyone who has any individual questions they wish uh, the company to address. There is also a Deputy Attorney General, a member of the Kentucky Attorney General's staff who is here and who will also be available to you to discuss this matter. Now, at this time, would the representatives of Kentucky Power please stand so the members of the audience can know who you are and, uh, and where you are. So when the meeting is over, please feel free to go speak with uh, Kentucky Power personnel. I noticed that Mr. Satterwhite, Matt Satterwhite, the president of Kentucky Power, is here, and, uh, and he has a number of staff members with him. Uh, would you please, Mr. McNeil, stand and introduce yourself. He, Mr. McNeil is a representative of the Kentucky Attorney General's Office. Okay? Now, those of you wishing to speak should have indicated your intention to do so when you signed in this evening. If you have not signed in, uh, you may do so now uh, and state whether or not you intend to speak or uh, so that we may have a complete record in this proceeding. Now, what's going to happen is, after it's over, I will ask if anyone else who hasn't signed up would like to speak, and whether you wanted to sign up or not, if you later decide you want to speak, please feel free to come up and, uh, and do so. I will tell you this, that as of today, we probably have at least 150 letters that have been sent to the Public Service Commission that are on file. And between the three of us, I can promise you that we have read every one of the letters that have been sent. So your comments will be taken seriously in deciding this case. Okay? Based on the number of people who have indicated a desire to speak, and that right now is at 41, 
uh, we're going to allow five minutes per speaker uh, so that everyone has the opportunity to be heard. Uh, one of our staff will serve as timekeeper and will let you know when you have one minute remaining and when your time is up. There may be some times when someone else has already spoken and said what you wanted to say and you might stand up and kind of me too or, or, uh, or, or briefly state uh, that your position is the same. So, uh, or you may uh, yield the floor to someone else. So it is informal, but we need to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. Uh, so that's why it's limited to uh, five minutes. Uh, those of you who do not wish to speak may submit comments in writing. Uh, we have comment forms that are available here. Uh, so if you want to pick those up tonight, you can uh, fa mail them to the PSC or fax them to the PSC, and they will become part of the record. Uh, as you can see, this meeting is being videotaped, and the tape will be available on the Public Service Commission website. A summary of the public comments received tonight will be prepared for the Public Service Commission and will become a part of the case record, which is also available on the website. All written comments also will be entered into the case record. Written comments will be accepted through the date of the formal evidentiary hearing in this case. That hearing, during which the Kentucky, uh, Kentucky Power and other parties will present their cases to the PSC and will be subject to cross-examination. This hearing will begin at 9 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday, December 6th at the Public Service Commission offices at 211 Sauer Boulevard in Franklin and may last several days. It is open to the public and also will be streamed live on the Public Service Commission website, which once again is psc.ky.gov, so you can go to the website and actually watch the hearing and hear the testimony if you wish. Uh, three important things to keep in mind before we begin. Because the Commission must rule on the Kentucky Power application, we cannot answer questions pertaining to the substance of this case. However, questions you raise during this meeting may well be of assistance to the Public Service Commission and its staff as we prepare for the evidentiary hearing. Uh, PSC staff, who some of whom you met out front, uh, will be available after this public comment section is concluded to answer any questions you may have regarding procedural matters in the case. The Public Service Commission has jurisdiction only over the rates and services of utilities. We have no jurisdiction over matters such as environmental standards or public health. Those are regulated by a number of federal, state, and local agencies. Therefore, the most helpful comments are those that directly address the merits of the Kentucky Power proposal with respect to the size and structure of the requested rate adjustment and the reasons for the adjustment. If you have concerns or questions about service or billing or individual accounts, the most effective way to have those addressed is to speak with a member of the Public Service Commission staff after this meeting or call our toll-free consumer hotline at 800 772-4636 during regular business hours. Now, when you come up to speak, please state your name and place of residence. And again, please keep your comments to the allotted time of five minutes so that others may have an opportunity to address the commission. Now, we have with us uh, here this evening several guests. Uh, a uh, a prominent state official, Mr. Stephen Pruitt, the Commissioner of Education, who is here to speak uh, as the Commissioner. Uh, and we also have Senator Brandon Smith, State Representative Chris Fugit, State Representative Tim Couch, and State Representative Angie Hatton. So we're going to give our elected representatives and our public officials the opportunity to speak first, after which After this, after which we will call out the uh, citizens who would like to speak in the order in which their name appears on the sign-in sheet. 
Uh, Commissioner Pruitt, would you like to come forward at this time and uh, address the commission? Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come speak tonight. My name is Stephen Pruitt, 300 Sour Boulevard, Frankfort, Kentucky, 40601. Uh, as you've already said, I am the Commissioner of Education for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I'm here tonight on behalf of 24 school districts and the 10 state-run area technical centers in the Kentucky Power Service area that would be impacted by the proposed rate increase. If approved as proposed, we calculate the rate would increase cost to schools in excess of $1.8 million annually. Right now, many of our schools are fighting just to keep the lights on and the doors open. They have done their share with energy conservation and remain the only entity in Kentucky that are required by statute to develop energy management plans. This proposed rate increase threatens our district's ability to deliver their, on their constitutionally and morally obligation to educate the children of Eastern Kentucky. I'd like to start with a couple of examples. First of all, I'd like to point out Pike County School District. The district has 20 schools and about 8,600 students, 75% of whom qualify for free and reduced price lunch. There are two state area technical centers located in the county. Based on their current usage, Pike County estimates the proposed rate hike will cost the district around $410,000 in an increased utility cost each year. Now, on the surface, that may not sound too bad because there is the ability of the district to impose a 3% uh, tax themselves on the, on the utility. However, I'd like to point out a little scenario. Currently, Pike County receives $3.7 million in revenue from the 3% utility tax that it levies. This tax includes taxes that are part of the Kentucky Power Bill, also taxes on natural gas, cell phones, and other such. But let's just say for a moment that Kentucky Power represents about 80% of the utility tax. I don't know the exact number, but this is a, an assumption that we've made. At a rate increase of 14%, the district would see only about 12,721 additional dollars from the utility tax, resulting in a net annual increase in cost for the district of more than $397,270. Now to put that in perspective, it's equal to what is spent in the district on instruction for 64 students. It's equal to what is spent on instructional staff to support 640 students. And at an average teacher salary, $397,000 translates into at least seven teaching positions. In recent years, Pike County sustained extreme financial hardships due to the collapse of the coal mining industry. It's lost about 10% of its, of its population. It's neg been negatively impacted by the, by the state education funding because of those losses. The loss of jobs and population has resulted in the decline in overall property taxes. The district already has a tenuous financial position and its downward adjustment in the unmined mineral assessment calculation which resulted in the loss of $1.5 million. They're not even at this point able to to conduct, to withhold the 2% contingency as required by state law. They are literally going month to month and at times week to week to be able to keep the doors open. In Leslie County, we see a similar issue. The proposed tax rate would, would cost the district an additional $67,000. With the additional utility tax collected, the net cost of the district would still be $64,750. In Fairview Independent, where we see a similar outcome, their net cost will be $23,500. In the words of their superintendent, we simply can't absorb these cost increases, period. The Breathitt County Area Technical Center would see, with this increase, an additional $6,160 a year. The money's going to have to come from somewhere, and at this point, one has to ask where. We continue to see a de an increase in or a decrease in, in our state funding. This year we've had to prepare for a 17.4% reduction across state government, and in particular looking at what that would look like in, in the future biennium. We know that there's a K-12 tariff, 
Kentucky Power is proposing to eliminate the pilot K-12 tariff that provides a more favorable rate for schools based on their unique load and usage characteristics. I would argue against this. According to the testimony presented by Ron Wilhite, School Energy Manager Project Director for the Kentucky School Boards Association, this tariff produces a rate return for Kentucky Power more than one and a half times that of its average. Thus, it cannot and should not be considered unfair, unjust, or unreasonable as the company contends. Our districts continue to work hard. They have, they've done their due diligence. They have done everything they can to, to cut costs and to implement, implement cost savings around energy. But the reality is that from an economic perspective, uh, this area of the state continues to really to bleed out when it comes to, to what we're having to pay for education. Earlier I said I was here on behalf of 24 school districts and 10 area centers. But what I'd like to be more clear on is I'm really here on behalf of 60,444 students who attend schools in the Kentucky Power Service area. If they are ever going to break the cycle of poverty that has dominated this region of the state for so long, there must be adequate resources to ensure they receive an excellent elementary and secondary education. This will allow them to have further training or to attend college and be prepared to land a good paying job, but most importantly, be allow, allow them to pursue the passion of their choice. So I urge you on the behalf of these students and their families and their future to reject the proposed rate increase and to maintain the K-12 school tariff. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. State Senator uh, Brandon Smith. Senator Smith, would you like to step forward and uh, address the commission? First, I'd like to welcome the commission to the mountains here in East Kentucky, specifically Hazard. We're glad to have you here with us, and we're glad that you're going to give us a few minutes this afternoon to listen to our concerns. Being someone who's grown up here in the mountains, many of us have had family that have worked for the power company. Uh, the power company Christmas dinner used to be a favorite thing in our family. My mother worked downtown uh, on Main Street uh, up front, and that's where they would drop me out for school to meet her. So it's played a role in a lot of our lives. And so to find ourselves here today with so much have changed in our community, being concerned where it is, uh, it's troublesome for a lot of us. I think a lot of us have got other things to worry about with job losses the way they are, with the unemployment rate being at record levels, uh, with, with our, our children and schools. There's so much other worries that I reckon most of us would rather be anywhere else than here tonight. But we're here uh, because we have a great concern. Now, one of the things in the Senate that we have to look at are numbers. And for all the people that are fooled with economics, you get in what's called the law of diminishing returns. Now, recently, two years ago, we had a rate increase that the case was made and apparently was, was passed by the um, Public Service Commission to grant them an increase. But in the meantime, what's happened here is that we have not had jobs that have grown with that. Matter of fact, with that increase, and I'm not saying that's what caused it, but we've had more and more jobs lost. We've had Wayne Supply Caterpillar hasn't laid anybody off here in 100 years, and now they've shut down their operations here in Hazard, Kentucky, uh, which leaves you scratching your head uh, that we would not have that facility here. Just recently, two weeks ago, PepsiCo has announced that it's pulling out of Hazard, Kentucky. Uh, there's just not anything left. And I think the concern of us as leaders and as fathers and mothers and, and uh, teachers and workers in this community is that if this next increase comes in and we're into what's called the law of diminishing returns, how many more jobs can we lose? And the answer to that is not many because there's nothing left. You're standing in probably the largest employer that we have in this county, right here in this room. Between the school system and the hospital, that's all that's left. The few coal mines that we used to have are struggling and barely keeping themselves open, mostly just to keep the uh, security guard or chain on the gate because they're not moving coal anymore. The trucking companies have all gone. They've shuttered their doors. Uh, it's, it's the worst I've ever seen here in my lifetime. And I will tell you, hopefully you guys will maybe be around tonight uh, and you can see tomorrow for yourself, drive down through Hazard. Take a drive down through what it used to be because it's not that anymore. So we're not here tonight against anybody. 
this isn't a fight against our friends that that work over here we've got my neighbor lives up the hill from me he's one of the best guys i know he works for the power company and he takes a lot of pride in his job but i've also got people that live down over the hill down here that cannot afford to pay their bill they're three months behind they're good people too so you all are in the middle to find a pathway forward for us but i will tell you i know each one of you are smart and you're courageous or you wouldn't be down here and you want to do the right thing the law of diminishing returns is showing that the increase in these numbers is causing further and further job loss. What is the sweet spot? When you would go back, if we are able to reduce rates, are we able to create jobs back here? Are we able to see growth back in the mountains? I've seen the graphs that show out migration. People can't stay here anymore. You know, it used to be people would go to Ohio so they could work for Fisher Body and these other the auto industry there, but they're long gone. The jobs now are farther south for us, and there's fewer of them. And I tell you what, I don't want to leave. How about you all? There's an old adage, it's Isaiah, it says, come my brother, let us reason together. Hopefully tonight, uh, you all will truly hear us. Uh, you'll hear some of the frustration and concern, but it's not anger. We're not, we're not mad. We're concerned and there's a difference. And we have a reason to be, because you all will leave here tomorrow and stop a few other places and go back to cities that are having growth right now, but not us. That's not what my week is going to look like. Is it yours? So we ask that you take that in consideration as you all make your decision. Thank you. State Representative Chris Fugit. Good evening. Thank you all for coming uh, down to Hazard uh, today. And uh, this evening, I'm the state representative of the 84th district, which um, is all of Perry County, part of Harlan County. Uh, Perry County is in the service area for Kentucky Power. Well, I also agree with Senator Smith that um, I have a lot of friends that work for Kentucky Power, and this is not an attack on my friends or anybody that works there. However, we do have a, we do have a problem with uh, job loss in our in our uh, region. The state average unemployment rate is 5.3 percent. Perry County's um, unemployment rate is listed at 9.9 percent, which is probably a low figure if you uh, figure in the amount of people who have went off the job market, basically, because of a lack of jobs. We have uh, men in our and uh, ladies in our county who travel to Mount Vernon every day uh, to work. We have uh, men that are traveling to Toyota and back every day. They work a 10, 12 hour shift and coming back to uh, back and forth every day to travel. It's a lot of, that's a lot of uh, effort on uh, people of our area that, that they, they really want to work. What I believe that this rate increase will do to us is it will reduce the uh, interest of companies coming to our area. Uh, and uh, while I understand that uh, the rate increase is probably due to the lack of um, commercial customers. I don't feel like that that load should be passed on uh, to the residential customers who are already suffering uh, because of the lack of the jobs and because of the lack of industry here in our area. Uh, I pastor a church um, with uh, probably three, 300, 350 members each week. Uh, we run buses all across the county. Uh, to bring in people to our church and uh, one one particular lady is she's in her 70s she rides our church bus into church on Sunday morning Wednesday night she lives in a mobile home that's probably probably 35 40 years old she doesn't have uh, income uh, any higher than about six hundred fifty dollars a month uh, there's been several months that she has asked us to help pay her electric bill because of because of the lack of income. Now the truth is, she's stuck. She can't improve her her living. She can't improve her her residence. Uh, she can't. She has no means. So she comes. It comes down to the point that she has to choose between medicine, groceries, and paying her electric bill. Uh, when you look at a three hundred and fifty dollar electric bill for a single wide mobile home, uh, that's just to me to have another increase on that is putting more hardship on the people of our 
of our county. We have good people here that want to work hard. The truth is there's people that, that have worked hard for 30 and 40 years that are out of work now. And if we add on another 16% uh, onto their electric bill, all we're doing is either driving them away from our county and the place that we live and call home, or we're, we're causing them to have to drive a distance to work, or just trying to make it simply just living off the land. There are some people in our county who live without electricity now because they can't pay their bills. Now, I understand that Kentucky Power has to make money, uh, but according to a, just a simple Google search, American Electric uh, Company, um, American Electric Power, which is the mother company, the CEO of American Electric Power, according to the simple Google search, and I don't know how accurate this is, uh, between the salary bonus and and other benefits made $11.1 million in 2016. I think that they should look inwardly to try to find some cuts on the inside rather than passing that cost on to uh, the people of the mountains, especially the 84th District. And I appreciate your uh, coming to Hazard tonight. <clears throat> State Representative Tim Couch, Hyden, Kentucky. My name is Tim Couch, 215 Middle Lane, Hyden, Kentucky, 41749. I represent the 90th District, Clay Leslie, and part of Law Counties. I stand here to represent the 10,000 people of Leslie County. Uh, to give them a voice of opposition to the rate increase and the 2,500 uh, residents that are uh, of the Kentucky Power Service area. First and foremost, I want you to realize that the 2015 increase that was referenced earlier with the presentation that we saw, um, my people have not uh, uh, They've not really, they, it's been a hardship on them and upon the elderly and the small businesses just with that rate increase alone. So what we're looking at now is another 15% increase. So you're looking at the state kicking in with this LIHEAP program and all the assistance to try to help these elderly to make ends meet. Now, I, I have a small business in Leslie County, and, and just to give you an example of uh, the difference between 15 years, um, I, I had a, uh, a rate bill of about, electric bill of about uh, $1,400 15 years ago. Right now, I'm averaging twenty-eight dollars to $3,000 uh, $3, a month. So this 15% 15 in, 15 increase will pretty much put us out of business there in that small business. So the loss of jobs, everyone knows and everyone here knows because they're feeling it because it's their families. Uh, we've been devastated by the uh, uh, the economy. Uh, we've lost 14,000 men. That's an estimate. It's more or less. It doesn't really doesn't matter. We lost that uh, men and women in the coal mining industry. And my question: uh, With those loss of jobs, how can we justify uh, a rate increase just on uh, the loss of service to? Uh, Kentucky Power. I mean, I just I can't see it. So, uh, what we do as small businesses, we we cut back and we use our money efficiently to to survive. So, I would think that uh, Kentucky Power would do the same. I have to mention my my local school district, um, uh, which uh, Commissioner Pruitt has uh, already mentioned. But uh, with just the rate increase that's proposed, you know, we're looking at $67,000 or more a month just for our school district in Leslie County, which right now we're struggling to make in, ends meet. You have 13 to 15 school di districts in East Kentucky that are on the state's watch, watch list. So out of, seven, out of that 13 to 15, seven of those will require state intervention this school year. So the, the districts can't absorb another rate increase. So the bottom line, we as Kentucky Power customers, we cannot afford a rate increase in the, econo in the economy that we are currently in. 
So the people of East Kentucky, I'd, I'd, you've heard about the uh, unemployment earlier. Uh, McGoffin County is almost 13 percent. Leslie County is right at 9 percent. East of 75, south of 64, uh, folks, we're, we're, at, uh, we're at an average about 10 percent unemployment, and uh, we just can't absorb it. I just uh, would hopefully that you guys would realize that and, and uh, take that into consideration. Thank you. State Representative Angie Hatton, lecturer in Pike Counties. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I know you've already heard from me once at the Floyd County meeting this week, so I'll try not to say exactly the same things I said before. But I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for coming down here and listening to our concerns in Eastern Kentucky about this devastating rate increase that, that you're being asked to approve. And while I'm here, I just want to thank each and every person that cared enough to show up tonight. We, that's what we do in Eastern Kentucky. We stand up for each other. So as elected representative of uh, Letcher County and parts of Pike County, I should introduce myself. I'm, you already said it, but I'm Angie Hatton, 20 Ohio Street, Whitesburg, Kentucky. Um, as elected representative of Letcher and parts of Pike County, I do my best to stand up for these people. But I feel like tonight each and every one of them is here standing up for themselves and standing up for each other and standing up for me and my family and all the family businesses in my community. And it means so much that people took their evening to come down here. So thank you all for listening to us. And please uh, listen with, with open minds and open hearts tonight at what we're going through. So I think every one of us is here to ask for basic, no frills, safe electric service. We don't need Cadillac electric service. We don't need all the bells and whistles. We don't need the riders. We don't need donations to various causes. We need safe, basic electric service. American Electric Power has a monopoly. So if we're living on a monopoly board, we don't need boardwalk property. We'll settle for Baltic Avenue property. Somebody's got a monopoly sign over here. We need the basic service at a price that we can afford. So I want to remind everybody as they come up and talk that the Public Service Commission is here to listen to us. They're, they're, we're not talking to AEP. We're not talking to people that should be considered our enemies. These are people that are going to decide this decision. I want to ask everybody to please be respectful, not direct hateful comments, but provide information that can help us decide, help them decide what's best for us. And, Members of the Public Service Commission, you're going to be asked to do what's fair, just, and reasonable. I know you know how to do your jobs. And plenty of other people today will get up here and talk to you about details of decisions they've been having to make between medicine or food and their electric bills. These are true stories. I, I know for a fact I've heard individual stories, eight out of every ten emails that I was getting my first six months in office were about people's electric bills. Of all the things that I thought I was going to Frankfurt to work on, I didn't realize it was going to be electric bills, but they've gotten so out of hand, people cannot pay them. This is something that truly does affect us all. It affects every family, it affects every business, it affects every school system and every government. And Commissioner Pruitt, if you're still here, I, we don't know each other, but I was very impressed that you came down from Frankfurt and gave statistics that were so well thought out and so meaningful to me about exactly what this burden will place on our school system. So thank you for doing that. My two school systems are Letcher County Schools, which will face $152,000 per year extra based on um, the increase that's been requested, and Pike County Schools, which will be over $400,000. And it's beyond ironic to me that this 
community of Eastern Kentucky that for two centuries has been powering our nation with our coal. We're now struggling to keep our own lights on. We're not asking you for a handout. We're asking you to do what's fair and just and reasonable for these hardworking people. I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank Attorney General Andy Bashir for stepping in on our behalf. He's the only one, as our information said earlier, that's guaranteed a right to intervene on behalf of us, so we appreciate that courage and, and, and for his representation. So you've heard a lot of information about the poverty um, that we're experiencing here, the unemployment that we're experiencing here. People will lose basic services if this is allowed to um, be passed, and they'll very likely lose their homes, many of them, and they'll be turning to the state for assistance at a time when the state can least afford to help them. And it's not like American Electric Power is facing similar distress. Their stock price has almost tripled since 2009, and it's risen by about 20% in the last year or so alone. But that's not enough. Apparently they need another $63 million. And the people in this room and the people that we represent know that it's time to stand up and push back. We won't be happy if they get a half or even a fourth of what they're asking for. They need an outright denial of any rate increase. We don't want a handout, but we've been through enough, and we just don't want to be kicked while we're down. Amen. So I understand that Kentucky Power is a business. They want to make money. That's what businesses do. They're supposed to try to make money for their shareholders, but thank goodness we have you to stand in the way of that if it's not fair, just, and reasonable. I talked to my local optometrist one day this week. She said, this increase is going to be $3,300 a year extra. Either that's money that she won't have profits to reinvest in her community at grocery stores and, and gas stations, or that's money that she has to pass along to her customers in order to even make ends meet at her optometry office. Every single business that I go in, that's what they want to talk about. They're power bills. They can't afford to stay in business. That's not good for economic development. That's not going to advance our region. That's not going to help us get back out of this terrible situation that we found ourselves in with the downturn in the coal industry here. And so at a time when I've been asking for extra hearings, we appreciate the three you gave us, but a lot of people don't have the gas money to get to these hearings. And when we talk about American Electric Power asking us for $388,000 for corporate jet travel, and we don't have gas money to get to these hearings. So it's folly to expect that the customers of Kentucky Power are asked to make Kentucky Power whole for the decline in the economy. They need a rate increase to make up for the loss of customers and the general decline in electrical use. But there's no logic in that because it just becomes a downward spiral. The more they raise rates, the more customers they will lose and the more increases they're going to come back and ask for. And higher rates are going to make Kentucky less competitive when we're trying to attract businesses here. It's always been one of the things that we could count on, but we've had increase after increase. Since 2005, Kentucky Power has been granted three rate increases of almost 6% a year for residential cu customers, which is a total of over 51%. They were given permission to shut down their largest power plant the Big Sandy too, which meant the loss of 150 jobs at the plant, lost revenue to support schools, local governments, and the loss of over 2 million tons a year of sales of Kentucky coal to that plant 
and coal-related jobs that went with it. To replace it, Kentucky customers were asked to take a 50% interest in an almost identical plant in Moundsville, West Virginia that had already been paid for by AEP's Ohio utility customers. American Electric Power is one of the largest electric utilities in the United States, serving 5.4 million customers in 11 states. Now, my great-grandmother, I asked her one time if there was any one of the 14 kids that she loved the most. Surely, Grandma, you know, there's one that you love more than the others. And she said, yes, absolutely. Whichever one needed me the most was the one that I loved the most. Eastern Kentucky is the needy child right now. We don't want a handout. We don't want you to feel sorry for us. We just don't want you to continue to let them kick us. So thank you for your time. Please hear us. We have we have another elected official whose name didn't appear on the uh, the speaking list, but who's asked to speak, and that's Pike County Magistrate Jeff Anderson. Mr. Anderson, would you please come forward? Thank you, Commissioner Schmidt, Commissioner Williams, Cicero. Uh, I am Jeff Anderson. I'm a magistrate, Pike County Fiscal Court. Uh, I was going to call you, Commissioner Schmidt, and, and congratulate you on your on your new position. I, I, I didn't. I don't know if it's congratulations or condolences, but at, at any rate, uh, I know that you all will do the right thing. Uh, I, I have. Uh, I, I know you're in a, a tough spot, and it's not a, a an easy task that the three of you all are uh, charged with. Uh, I had my mind made up when I was driving over tonight from Pikeville what I was going to speak about. And I kept on reciting it over and over and over. And then Commissioner Pruitt gets up and he starts talking about Pike County. And, it, and so I'm, I'm having to change my speech, but, uh, which is fine. I don't, I don't have a problem doing that. But, you know, one of the things that one of the problems we have in Pine County you know we've we've been we've been hit with 142 percent water rate increases 150 percent sewer rate increases and these aren't stepped up rate increases these are things that we've been hit with at once uh, and it's tough it, it's it's really tough uh, we we live in a county that had our utilities managed by a, a private company, and I'm, I'm sure you all are aware of the recent Supreme Court decision. Hopefully, we'll know where some of the money that was supposedly going to water and sewer and infrastructure upgrades, repairs, was uh, how that money was spent. It's been a big, big issue, uh, but that's something that's, that's not what we're here to discuss today. Uh, I'd like to thank the Attorney General's office uh, for coming. Uh, I did, uh, wasn't able to come to the Prestonburg meeting, but I did go to the Attorney General's uh, press conference uh, that he had in, at uh, Pikeville College. <coughs> and I don't think any of us knows what fair, just, and reasonable is. As the gentleman that spoke before you all came out, uh, that's a tough, it's a tough, tough thing to determine. And I'm like Senator Smith. Uh, I have friends, uh, all kinds of friends that work for Kentucky Power. Uh, and I don't think anybody's mad at, at, the, at, at these people. And we all have to, to work together and live together. One of my best friends I've known forever is a supervisor for Kentucky Power and he happens to, to live in your hometown. Right? And you probably know who I'm talking about. I won't mention his name. But, uh, you know, we, we have to try and figure out, I suppose, where we're going to reach a happy medium. You know, where does it stop? Uh, you know, we had in, in, in Pine County, and uh, it, it was a tough thing we had to do. We had to pass a 1% occupational tax. And 
lo and behold, you know, it's it's changed the form of government. It's it's really cre it's created some problems. But you know, I, I look, I, it, it was something that we had to do. We 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 looked at every avenue to cut benefits, you know, personnel, whatever we had to do. We we did it, and you know, we're 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 okay for the time being. And I suppose the point I'm making is I, I don't know everything there is to know about AEP and Kentucky Power. You know, maybe they can cut back some. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, I, I hope that when you all are, when you go back to Frankfurt and, and you are, are thinking about this, this rate increase, uh, you know, show some compassion. Uh, you know, in my opinion, I, I don't want to see them get anything if it's possible. Uh, that would be my definition of fair, just, and reasonable. But I, w I would like to thank you all uh, for coming, and uh, it's uh, much appreciated. I think you all have another another one in Ashland. I probably won't be there, but uh, uh, but anyway, keep the people uh, in mind. Times are tough. And, and there's nothing that I can tell you all that you don't already know. But thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. At this time, is there any other elected public official in the audience uh, who would like to come forward and speak? Yes, sir. Please step up, uh, provide your uh, name and uh, your office, and then uh, we'd like to hear your comments. I'm Jim Ward. I'm the Letcher County Judge Executive, and I do have some handouts here that I would like to hand out to you all. If you look and uh, look at a couple of them as a power bill, one of them is, is one of our buildings, our, our uh, physical court building. Uh, the power bill on it would have been $5,280.52. With all the fees, the bill was $6,857.26. That was $1,576.74. Now, that's what we're looking at as a county. That's what we're looking at as a region. Any type of business, any type of government, any type of anyone that has a large bill with all the fees that are added up, and then you add a possibly 16 to 17% more, with our economy, how, how is anyone going to afford it? Uh, you know, our budget went from $10.2 million down to $7.2 million in a matter of three and a half years. Uh, we're struggling. We have people laid off. Uh, we have people furloughed two days a month. How are those employees, how are those people going to pay an extra 16% on their power bills. Uh, you know, if you look back through there with all these adjustments, and you can go back and, and on the back page, uh, it does say that uh, uh, how the rates will fluctuate from one month to the next depending on the power company expenses. Uh, for example, each month the power company sends to the Public Service Commission their environmental receipts for that month's environmental expenses. There are regular month expenses and sometimes additional expenses depending on what is going on with the environment. 60 days later, those charges come out on your bill. Now, you know, uh, I understand that, that they need to make a profit, but also they have to understand the more that they raise their rates, the less companies are going to be able to stay here, the less jobs created, the less amount of residents that will be here. 
everyone's going to have to leave. You know, we're, we're struggling, and and as uh, Representative Hatt said, you know, uh, we're not looking for a handout. We just need to be able for the people to be able to have regular service. Uh, you know, so we, we're not looking, as, as she said, any frills in it. We, we, you know, I have a lot of friends that work for the prior company, but something that I think that, that needs to be looked at, and, and I hope that you all would, would, would take this to heart and look at it, is the business practices of the prior company. Are they running efficiently as they, as they can, as they should? Uh, you know, are all the fees counted in on, no, or on their gross income? Or is it counted uh, somewhere else? Uh, I think all this stuff needs to be looked at to see what the, their true numbers are. As our money goes down, we make cuts. We adjust. We don't, you know, we're not coming here and say that we need a big increase. We have to adjust. Uh, and, and I think it might be time for Kentucky Power to adjust how they're doing business. Because, as and it's just not my county, it's this whole region. You know, we're adjusting, why, why can't they adjust? You know, look at it, are, are they oh, any overinflated salaries? Look at all of it. You know, I, I, that's what I'm asking, to, to really get down and look at the practices. Have they cut back? Have, have, are they overinflated salaries? Uh, are they overinflated benefits? Uh, you know, let, let, let's look at the whole scenario. Let's not look at what they say their cost is uh, versus what they're bringing in. I don't know if those fees are included in those growths. You know, are they or are they not? So, you know, I think it's time for them to adjust like the rest of us have and cut back and not charge more than the people of this region can afford. Thank you all. Uh, is there any other uh, elected public official in the audience who'd like to come forward? Yes. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rose Wolf, and I'm the mayor of the city of Jackson. Uh, you want to talk figures, uh, statistics, and stuff? One of them I will give you is that the city of Jackson is probably the third poorest city in the state of Kentucky. We're being asked to do more with less, and we're trying to find a way to do this. A lot of our citizens are working two jobs, not full-time jobs, two part-time jobs just to pay their bills. And I can tell you from last year's electric bills, so many of our citizens had their power turned off because they could not pay their bills. The light heat programs and the subsidy programs that try to help them, so many of them, what they heard was, we've run out of money. We've run out of money. We can't help you. So who is going to help them this winter when they can't keep their power on to stay warm. We're facing one of the biggest homeless populations the city of Jackson has had in forever. We have so many unemployed, not by choice, but by a lack of jobs. If this power rate increase is given to Kentucky Power at the rate they are asking, I don't know what's going to happen to cities like Jackson and the citizens that live there. Our seniors and our elderly are drawing just over $600 a month. 
their electric bills are taking one-third to one-half of their income to keep them paid. I can tell you that last year alone, we had at least 14 fires in Breathitt County that were caused by old heating stoves and stuff because they couldn't afford to turn on their electric furnaces and they had to go back to the old coal stoves and the old coal furnaces and wood furnaces. And it wasn't safe in mobile homes and some of the homes they were living in. They lost everything to fires. How do I know this? Because I volunteer my time with the American Red Cross. I go out at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning because somebody's home just burnt because they didn't have the safe, safest type of heat. The city alone, I, I don't just worry about my citizens. They're my main concern. But I will tell you something I'm worried about for the city of Jackson. We are just barely meeting our power bills for our water and sewer plant. With all of our lift stations and our pump stations, the cost of electricity is so high for these water plants and these sewer plants that we're barely making it. What are we going to do if they're given this rate increase? Are we going to shut our water plant down? and Breathitt County have 5,000 and better homes without water? Are our sewer plants going to go down, our lift stations, our pump stations? Because that's what we're facing. Kentucky Power can't afford to operate at a loss. We all know that. None of us can afford to operate at a loss. But I'm not so convinced that they're even close to operating at a loss. What I am sure of is John Q. Public that lives at 101 Main Street isn't going to be able to keep their power on because their income is just over 600 a month if they're lucky and their power bill is going to take half of that. So what do they decide to do without? You tell me. They're already choosing between food and medicine. What do they give up? in order to pay that power bill. And since they got the rate increase in 15, as a mayor, I've had to deal with families that cannot pay their power bill. This isn't just during the winter. This is all year long. They have disconnect notices. They're coming to turn their power off because with no income and very little income, they cannot pay this. So what do we do? What's the answer? Everybody's turning to you all to have the answer. But what I want you to take a real good look at is, do they have a loss? Jim Ward said it perfectly. Where are they overpaying? Where are they overspending? What could they cut back? Every city and county in eastern Kentucky is being asked to do more for less. I think it's time Kentucky Power does more for less. A former president, which some of you aren't old enough to remember, believed in a trickle-down system. Well, this is what's going to trickle down. We have no employment. Kentucky power bills are going to go up. A lot of us have already had to raise our water bills because the power bills went up for our plants and our sewer, and we have to pay it in order to keep the systems running. So what is it that the people give up? What is it that they do without in order to meet Kentucky Power's demand for a rate increase? What, what are they giving up? What are they doing for less? I just want them to be on the same playing level as John Q. Public, who is just trying to put food on the table and raise their families 
and not starve to death in order to keep warm. Winners here. You guys are getting ready to make a decision. Please make a fair one. Please make a fair decision for everyone. Everyone. Thank you. Any other elected public official in the audience who'd like to speak? I'm kind of like the guy from Pikeville. It's kind of hard to say welcome here when we're looking at these uh, circumstances that, that we're faced with, and, and I'm going to use that in a little bit more. And we've talked about the... the can can the, you identify yourself? Yeah, the name Scott Alexander. Perry County Judge Executive. Uh, we've talked about the uh, profits and uh, what, what the loss and stuff rates are, and, and uh, people stuck on a lot of, touched on a lot of issues. So I'm, I'm just going to bring them up to the first nine months of 2017. They're at 19.9 million in profit. This is after uh, their uh, taxes and, and everything's been paid. Paid. Th th this is profit. Uh, you know, and one of the things, you know, I, this is the uh, third one of these that I've attended, uh, twice as a citizen, uh, worried about the coal industry and what we faced, and we all know where that's at now. And, you know, it's one of the worst economic crises that East Kentucky and all of Appalachia has ever faced, and, and, and here we are again. Uh, with that being said, back during the years of the booming of the coal industries, I never once heard a time of a reduction because of all the... Uh, jobs and mines and, and, and the extra power that was being used. So, uh, you know, if, if we use this philosophy of we got 5,000 homes and we're going to 4,000 homes, you know, so we've got to make up that difference in the loss of electricity. We also should be hearing from the Public Service Commission. We should have heard back during the years of the booming of the mining industry and our rates should have been lower. So uh, I'm asking the Public Service Commission to uh, ask uh, Kentucky Power and AEP to consider, you know, a couple years down the road to re to, to relook at a rate increase. The profit I spoke on is based on the current rate, so they're making they're they're, they're making money right now. And as far as we, you know, we, we've talked about the fiscal course, the school systems, and, and and all of those are hurting. But at the end of the day, most of our homes are hurting. So I ask you to consider putting any type of rate increase off for a couple years, give uh, East Kentucky a chance to catch its breath, get back on its feet before we consider any type of rate increase. Thank you. Any other public official who'd like to speak? Okay, if not, then we will uh, call uh, in order those who uh, signed up to speak this evening. And remember, we've uh, uh, been a little more, I guess, uh, lenient with uh, the public officials and Commissioner Pruitt because they represent everybody and not kept them to the five-minute limit. But if uh, we'd like, if at all possible, for you all to try to uh, adhere to five minutes, okay? The first name is Steve Brewer. My name is Steve Brewer. I live at now at 1175 Pea Ridge Road in Irving, Kentucky, 4336. I got off my deathbed to come here tonight. First thing before I get started, I'd like to uh, thank the communications director. I sat and listened to every word he said, and it reaffirmed what I already suspected. The power company pays nothing to operate. All the money that they operate on is your money, my money. That's where all the money comes from. Everything's reimbursable. That's number one. So, Mr. Communications Director, where do you go to? I'd like to say thank you. I don't see him. He must have. Uh, all right. <laughs> Next thing I'd like to say, I'm a retired United Mine Worker official. 
a lot of these people in here voted for me, kept me in office for a long time. They sent me to Washington, D.C. to be a lobbyist for the United Mine Workers. For them guys, I thank you. For the ones that's been my friends, as many of them sitting here for a long time, I want to thank them. Mr. Schmidt, first thing I'd like to say, I don't have to be nice, just respectful. I'm not running for no office. These guys over here for AEP, they have nothing to do with the rate increase. That rate increase is decided on by the CEOs and the higher up. Mr. Schmidt, I understand, if I'm wrong, correct me. I understand that all your adult life you've spent being an attorney for the power companies. What I'd like to say is you need to step aside on this case and not hear it. Because when these guys sent me to Washington, D.C., they didn't ask me to take they didn't ask me to take a mine superintendent. Did you guys ask did I take a mine superintendent with? No. I didn't take no mine superintendent. And so I'd like for you to step aside and let these other two, and they're both under suspect too because of who appointed them. But anyway, these people can't afford another rate increase. I've got a 3,000 square foot house in Irvine, Kentucky. My power bill is provided through Jackson Energy. I don't pay but $166 a month. It's not on no budget system. That's what my power bill is to heat and cool a 3,000 square foot house. Now, AEP's coming in here and asking. The power bill is not the problem. A friend of mine handed me her power bill a while ago. Her, power, her actual power bill is $169. But with the add-ons, it brings it up to $278. You can't catch up like that. You're taking one step forward, two step back. Another one of my friends brought me a newspaper. I want to take y'all, I won't take five minutes because I'm too sick, too old, I'm in, up in my 70s, and I, I just want to say what I got to say and get out of here. But anyway, look at here. My friend Paul Fleming brought me this paper. AEP, Kentucky Power, donates $120,000 to pot. You know where that money come from? Everybody's right. Everybody. That's where the money come from. Now I'm not the order I used to be whenever these guys elected me union president for so many years. I'm not the order that I am that when they sent me to Washington. But I still got a voice. Mr. Schmidt, you need to resign. I'd say that not a person in here trusts you. Not a person. How many of you in here trust me? Huh? I don't see nobody raising their hand. But anyway, that's enough said about that. And some statistics, which I'm not a statistic man. I'm just a plain old coal miner that got elected as a union official, and the union does everything they've told me they'd do. Thank you, boys, for voting me in there. All right. The average income in our county is $22,000 a year. The unemployment rate is about 15%. The rate increases from 2006 until 2016 equals 39.59%. The total between all of them, they've got a 39% increase. Even when these guys voted me to go to Washington, D.C., I never got a 39% increase in, in salary. I never got a 20% increase in salary. When they sent me to Washington to represent them, I probably got a 6% rate increase. And you know what it cost? You know what it cost to live in Washington, D.C.? My efficiency apartment was $920 a month. So anyway, Y'all need to do something. But one thing you don't need to do is raise the rate on these people here that can't afford to pay it anymore. They, uh, they said, they said, Steve, what we'll do, they said, 
they, AEP said, what we'll do is we'll reduce it from 17% to 15%. And I said, zero percent. Zero. That's all I've got to say. I hope I didn't take up the time. And like I said, I'm not running for no office. I'm too old and too sick, and I don't need to be anything but respectful, and I hope I was. And all due respect, Mr. Schmidt, I'd like for you to resign. We, uh, you know, have said from the beginning that we're not going to answer questions or be involved in any, any kind of debate. But I can tell you, I don't know where you got that information, but I've never represented Kentucky Power Company in my life. Power companies. I've never represented Kentucky Power Company in my life. Power companies. Power companies. I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, well, you may have had Columbia Gas years and years ago. But that's the, uh, there's no, I have no forum. I've retired from practicing law over a year ago. And I haven't represented no power companies. So, in any event, we'll call the next uh, speaker. Uh, is it Katricia Rogers? Um, my name is Katricia Rogers, and I live at um, Perk Creek, Quattsburg, Kentucky, for 1858 in Letcher County. Um, I want to go back to what the gentleman spoke of in his presentation. He, he said that we've got to be fair, just, and get it correct. It has to be fair, just, and reasonable. So I'm going to give you a couple scenarios. You might tell us it's just an extra $20 a month. Most of you on this panel are middle class or more, fluent enough to where $20 a month may not be that much for you. For some of us in this audience, it may not be that much for us. But I wanted to give you some more things that's going on in these eastern Kentucky counties, communities. First of all, the top five, the top five, this is just five people, of Kentucky Power in the year 2016, after they brought in their salaries, bonuses, and commissions, earned over $24.3 million. Five people brought in over $24.3 million. And if you've heard from other people, some people's incomes are lucky to be $600 a month. Yet you're asking them to pay an extra $20 a month, but you're not asking those top five people, what kind of business decisions can you be making for Kentucky Power to cut your costs down? One person brought in over $11 million alone in 2016. One person. And I'm going to tell you, it's more than just $20 a month for someone like myself or some of these people's audience. As you heard from Mr. Jim Ward, he's our judge executive. Now he's going to be faced with a decision how to pay the electric bills for our county. Counties don't make profits, so he's going to have to find a way to pay for an extra electric bill cost. That's going to be more on property tax, which he's already had to raise because of the decline of jobs, the decline of income that's coming in from the state. So now we're going to have, we, just in a couple of weeks, in Letcher County alone, we've had a water bill raised, $8, I think. He, he's going to have to raise property tax, which is understandable of what's, with what the current situation he has been faced with. Now I'm going to have to pay an extra $20 if this rate increase goes through. So, yes, to you, you might tell me it's just an extra $20. But in the past few weeks, I'm looking at now I'm going to be paying an extra for about $300 this year. Now, on top of that, the schools that my children will be attending are also facing with the same scenarios. How are they going to pay for this extra cost? They're going to have to lay teachers off, as you just heard from our commissioner. These schools are going to have to come up with this money from somewhere. And I can guarantee you, these, tw these five members who's made $24 million, it ain't going to be coming from them. Guess who it's going to be coming from? It's going to be coming from people like me and these people who can only make $600 a month. So now my children's schools are going to have, be less, have less qualified teachers, if they have, if, even if they can keep the amount of teachers they have. Our cities are going to be, how they're going to provide water and sewer and basic necessities to us. So it's a, a bigger picture 
Then someone standing up there and telling us, oh, it's just 20, an average of $20 more a month. It's a lot bigger picture than that. As a Representative Angie Hatton said, we're getting, we're getting beaten as we're down. We're not asking for a handout, but how much more beaten can one community take? All we're asking is maybe this is not the time for a rate increase when they're making huge profits they have not came back with anything saying what kind of cuts that they're going to be making, yet we're going to be taking all this cost. So I'm asking you to think about the members that are in your community who may not be as fluent as yourself, but those members in your community who are barely surviving. I have family members who are on a fixed income, and I hear them say, how am I going to pay for a higher water bill? How am I going to pay for the electric bill I already have? How am I going to pay for an increase when I can't pay for the one I already have? So I'm asking that, is it fair and just and reasonable for five people to bring in over $24 million in one year, and you're asking us, a community who is barely getting by, to pay an extra 15 to 20 percent more on our electric bills. Thank you. Alice Kraft. I want to thank you all for being here today and allowing us to voice our concerns and I appreciate you very much. And I'd really like for you to take into consideration that we are in hard times here uh, due to the coal jobs that, that are lost. And, uh, and the, it, it breaks my heart to see families suffering. They are just like you and me and working men and women want to provide for their families and take care of their families and raise their kids. But we don't need to be beaten down like Angie Patton said. We don't need any more beaten down by AEP or anybody else. We're proud. We want to work and have a life, but we just can't keep getting these increases on us. And uh, it's just, and it's nothing to hear tell of a of a hunt of a thousand dollars to eight hundred dollars a month. People having electric bills, and you know the families. It's, it's, it's a trickle down effect. It's affecting the business, the schools, the, uh, not just the uh, low income families, the working class families. You know, when a family uh, like my son and uh, my daughter, they have good paying jobs. They work in the hospital. But when it takes half of their payday to pay their electric bill, what is left? Nothing much. And then like I got this neighbor, She's got four children, and she's on a fixed income. And she come to me, and she said, what am I going to do? She said, I can't pay my electric bill, and I have to pay rent. She said, really, it's a no-brainer. I have to pay my rent. She said, at least we'd have shelter. And she said it wouldn't be the first time either that she uh, had to go and be, have no power. She said, we've lived in the dark before. We can do it again. That's what it's really coming to. These people are hurting in Letcher County in eastern Kentucky. And we don't want you to feel sorry for us. We don't. We want to stand up for ourselves. And that's what we're doing here tonight. We need your help. We, need, we don't need no increase from AEP. We need a decrease from them. We can't stand no more. Our backs are broken. And we need your help and we appreciate it. And I tell you what. Uh, and there's another, there's an, I want to tell you about this other couple. Well, it's just not a couple, it's an elderly couple. And then this is a, another family. You know what they do, what they're doing right now where it's getting winter? They're blocking off all the rooms in their house. Yes. And they're going to sleep in the living room yes. and pull the mattress off the bed so they can have and, and stay warm in that one room because they can't afford their electric bill. Now, these are real people and real, real stories. They're not just, just fiction. This is real life, people. And they are having to make hard decisions, these families are. And I tell you what, all I can say is shame, shame on AEP.
Rose Wolf. Oh, I'm sorry. I... <laughs> Freddie Coleman. I didn't have her last name when she came. <clears throat> My name is Freddie Coleman. I live 795 Kingdom Come Creek in Letcher County. The main reason that I, I'm getting involved in this, every year I see an ad in Mountain Eagle AEP or Kentucky Power Advertising for something, you know, rate, some kind of little small rate increase, something, but they are continuously gouging their customers. Every year, I mean, in Mountain Eagle or something. And, you know, I'm kind of tired of seeing that in the newspaper, you know. But, and, and there's something I'd like to read you, the reason why. It was sent to me by Kentucky Power. Why? And it's a question and answer letter from Kentucky Power. And they, and they say, why is Kentucky Power seeking a rate increase for the Kentucky Public Service Commission? And, uh, okay, the answer is Kentucky Power is facing challenges of, on several fronts, industrial, commercial, residential, and a declining because of a struggling regional economy. Since 2014, Kentucky Power has lost nearly, I mean, Kentucky Power has lost nearly 2,000 residential customers and 450 industrial cultures, resulting in a 14.5% decrease in, electric, in electricity usage. You know, Kentucky River is aware of what's happening in, in eastern Kentucky, these 20 counties. They are aware of what's going on because they would make a state like this. But also, they have shut, I think, five to six power coal fire power plants already. And, and I'd also like to state that President Trump has wrote back a lot of these regulations on the coal power plants. He's wrote them back. So, you know, they don't face the same issues they faced, faced during the Obama administration. Okay, and then... Uh, You know, uh, you know, we have lost a lot of jobs, and but most of the jobs that are left in Eastern Kentucky are small jobs. You know, I guess minimum wage jobs. You know, that's pretty much all that's left in Eastern Kentucky, other than the, what the school employees in the county. But speaking of the county, Mr. Ward got up and spoke about the county. You know, if we could save a few dollars from the power bills in the county. Maybe we could hire more people to put on road work to keep our roads up because our roads is going down very bad. And we don't have enough people to work on our roads. And why should we give the money to AEP? I mean, when we need road works to maintain, and then when the roads do go down, we ain't going to have the money to have them paved again or have them fixed again. Okay, I'd like to read you something else. It's AEP newsletter. There in the third quarter of 2017, the GE, GAAP, AEP earned $375 million. And they're, op and, uh, they're operating uh, earnings was uh, 300 and see, was $375 million. Okay. Okay, for the fourth, for the fourth, this was for the second quarter. For the for the third quarter, AEP earned five hundred and forty-five million dollars. That is a large increase. That's pretty, you know, from three seventy-five to five hundred forty-five million dollars. They earned it. Now, how can earning money like that? How can they gouge the working person? And old people that can't afford to pay it. I mean, they should be ashamed of themselves to want to do this. They, they care very little about their customers. All they are is to gouge and get what they can. Okay. I'll move on. 
lot, lot that I was going to say has already been said, so I will not waste your time. But I, if, if this rate increase goes through our power bill, on average, I mean, we'll increase $100 a month. During the winter, just the add-ons to our power bill averages around $100, not counting what the power bill is. But we have one month that the add-ons onto a power bill last winter when it was real bad was $137 add-ons. And, uh, and, let me see. But also, it looks like Kentucky Power is trying to change every aspect of the businesses because they they uh, they have 16 pages in the Mountain Eagle here where they advertise for rate increases on different things. See that? Okay, I like to give you. I mean, there's six pages, and uh, okay, on this economic surcharge that Kentucky River is proposing, uh, you know, they shouldn't be allowed to do this because they're taking up money for economic economical development, but this money should not go through the hands of Kentucky Power or AEP because it you know, they shouldn't be in that type of business, business of deciding who gets all that money. And uh, also I bring up something about the, the big Sandy Power Plant and Mitchell Power Plant, which we're paying for. Uh, I, want, I would like to know who owns it. Who, who is going to own it since we are paying for it? And like Ms. Hatton stated, Ohio Power customers has already paid for it once, and now Ohio Power sold it to, uh, um, let's see, uh, Appalachian Power, and App Appalachian Power, uh, Wheeling Power, you know, and then they sold it, sold high folk to Kentucky. But, but since we're paying this loan off at the Big Sandy Power Plant, and we're buying half of the Mitchell Power Plant, who owns it? Who's going to own it in the end since we are paying for it? We're buying it. The customers are buying it. Why should Kentucky Power own this power on these power plants when they're not buying, paying for them when the customers are? I mean that's something that needs to be addressed. And uh, also I like to uh, uh, also I like to address something about the Attorney General's office and the, the Kentucky Public Service Commission. The cases that they file, they are filing them in Frankfort and Franklin County Court. I think any cases pertaining to uh, Kentucky Power Company, its customers should be filed in Hazard or Pikeville or Prestonburg or Weisberg or somewhere in this area where the, where the customer's base is so the people can get a fair shake because the judges and, and people in, in uh, Franklin County they don't care about us back here in these mountains. I mean, what we pay and what we don't pay. I don't, I don't think uh, Kentucky Power should get this raise because, you know, people can't afford it and it's going to bring hardship on the people of these 20 eastern Kentucky counties and, and, and 168,000 customers they have. And, and, and we shouldn't have to pick up where that Kentucky lost power, I mean lost uh, general, well, where, where they lost there. And uh, we, we shouldn't have to make a difference, you know, in their power loss, utilities and losing 2,000. The, the public shouldn't have to make the difference, the customers should. But I thank you all for coming out and listening to us. And thank you. All. Thank you. Elizabeth Jones.
Thank you all for coming. I'm Elizabeth Jones from 252 Fairview Lane in Neon, Kentucky. First, I want to thank our, all of our elected officials for their comments and all the points that they made. Thank you, Angie. Um, they know all the details of what we're up against. Now, I've come here tonight on behalf of all of our elderly citizens. There are so many who have lost their ability to live on their own and have lost their independence because of the high cost of electricity as it is. An 85-year-old lady who has went to my church for 50 years continued to fight a $700 power bill almost every month. She couldn't even hook up her hot water heater. She boiled her water on her stove to take a bath. She just broke her back recently, 85 years old. She recently had to move to another town with family members because she couldn't afford to buy groceries and pay, pay this bill. She was always behind every month. Now, she's no longer able to attend the church that she has been an integral part of for 50 years, all because of the high cost of her electric bill. My 80-year-old neighbor, who has been fighting cancer and lives alone, got her electric cut off one day a couple of months ago. And according to the bill she had, she still had time to pay it. She came home one day and her electricity was off. She had to call and beg and cry for someone to give her the money to get her electricity turned back on. And it wasn't very much that she was behind. When I addressed AEP about this situation, they sent me a letter, an email, stating, well, if she would have just called us back. <coughs> a gentleman stopped me in the pharmacy and spoke on how his brother had to move back in with their mother because her bills had reached $1,300 at its highest. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of those women who, and, and men who are not physically able to sit here and listen to all of these excuses for how this company is taking advantage of the fact that, that an electricity is a necessity. Now, according to the gentleman who gave all the details earlier, the presentation, the principal statute KRS 278 states that rates must be fair, just, and reasonable. How are the high prices in the poorest areas fair? Investors are entitled to an opportunity to earn a return on equity. That's what he said. Rate of return is based on trying to attract investors. Well, who wouldn't want to invest in a company that was allowed to continuously raise the cost to guarantee everyone involved got rich except the customers who are forced to use this specific provider? We have no other alternative. Our electricity only comes through them. They get bonuses while our people lose jobs. Doesn't seem fair to me. They lost customers because of what I am speaking of about tonight. Families have had to consolidate their, their homes. And now because of their initial greed that caused all of this, they want the customers to pick up that loss. Bad decisions and bad business practices are killing our people. Cut your own spending. Cut your own spending. Everybody else has to. All of this technical talk that he sat up here and, 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 and gave us, that, is, that, is on, that was only provided to us to justify how this electric company has set up their business practices to always make money off the backs of the poor people of southeastern Kentucky. Well, I'm sorry, but this business model is never afforded to the small business owners of southeastern Kentucky. Those who own and operate their own small businesses sure don't get that luxury of having a guarantee of return. There are a lot of small businesses getting ready to go out of business. Will there be another rate hike when they lose those customers? Large customers have lower cost of service, he said. 
The smaller the customer, the higher the cost. Are you kidding me? That's why our elderly are losing their homes, because they are paying the highest bills. The highest cost is leveled on residential customers. That's what he said. This is where our elderly, our small mom and pop businesses, and our families are hit. Now, our representatives have spoken about job loss. Do you know what that, lead, what that means? Poverty, homelessness, drug addiction, which we are already overrun with and growing because men can't support their families. This is creating emotional distress on people. It is affecting our souls. It's not just affecting our homes. You get to go home tonight to a very nice home. Most of us don't. I couldn't afford a babysitter tonight. I had to bring my children with me. And to try to sit here and keep them quiet is, is a hard thing. I am begging you to please deny this rate increase. These rate increases ha should have already been denied. This one cannot go through. Or they're going to lose even more customers. And then where's the money going to come from? Thank you. Brenda Braddock. Robert Lewis, I'm Robert Lewis from uh, Plattsburgh. Uh, I'm, a former, I'm a former Electric County Magistrate, and I especially want to thank our County Judge Jim Ward and their Representative Angie Hatton for coming tonight, and all these County officials to come tonight because they care, so they care for their people. Um, and the local power company, we go to church with these guys, we see them at the grocery stores. Our kids play ball together, or whatever. You know, there's nothing against. I've worked with these guys from AEP back when I was a heat pump dealer, and there's nothing against our local. We see them working in these storms, and we appreciate our local power company. But, and we know it's, you know, like somebody said, from the higher up where it's coming, and uh, it's staggering to see these uh, salaries here of the executives in AEP. Um, can we? Can you answer a question if it's not directly with the case? We can't answer. We're not permitted to. If to it's not related to the case, we can't. Answer. Can't. Okay. Well, we can hear it. Sure. You all, who we depend on, you all, you all are our public service commission. The buck stops with you all. The buck's not going to stop with AEP. Like uh, Angie said, what happens when they lose more customers? It keeps trickling down. Then they're going to want more increases because they've lost more revenue. But you all, you all need to show. People ask me, who is the Public Service Commission? Are they some highfalutin folks in the big city? And we, they said, they, we need common people. Well, show them that you're common people and you care about the common people by doing the right thing. You all are the public. We're the public service. You're the public. We are the public that need help right now. Our county is hurting so bad. And like I said, we can't stand anymore. It's, it's so bad. Um, just question, you know, we depend on you all to ask, will you all get to go in front of an AEP with this, with this thing, what you hear tonight, will you get to address them before you make your decision? Okay. All right. We hope you'll get to share these thoughts with AEP. Just what would be the consequences if the Public Service Commission just said no to any increase at this point in time due to the economy at this time. We read that one of the reasons for the rate increase, and it's been mentioned tonight, is because of the number of customers and commercial and residential they've lost over the years. If you guys had a business and you all sold or selling a thousand apples a month for a few years, and it got to where you're just selling five hundred apples a month. Well, the smart business people you are, you start just stocking 500 apples and not letting those 500 waste and rot and lose money. So why can't AEP cut back on generation costs and lower their cost? 
rather than try to make up, rather than try to make up it by customers lost by adding the increases to the people that can't stand it. It's just, it's just, we're just, we're hurting so bad. One thing I want to ask your, uh, your uh, announcer while I go, is it like an automobile dealer that AEP asked for 17% and then they said, well, we're going to change it to 15 because they're hoping that they're expecting you all to take, you're expecting you all to cut them, then they'll be satisfied if they get 7 or 8%. But, you know, like it says so much, right now these people can't stand any. Judge Alexander, you know, at this time said, wait for a couple of years maybe. Uh, give us the chance to rebound. You know, we're seeing some coal trains on the track right now. Our county's got, the coal severance tax has killed us by losing the coal severance tax. And, and that's been passed along to our county residents. And right now, i got to say this and I'll sit down. I walked into my sister's house this past winter. And she's sitting at the kitchen table with a coat on and gloves on and the lights off watching TV. And I said, what are you doing, Lee? She said, I, I, I'm not, I can't pay the, the power bill. And, and, and that's sad. And these people are, are, cho are choosing to have to live like this. And we depend on you guys to do the right thing. And just say no at this time. Just say no at this time. Marie Coleman. Patrick Green. Scott McReynolds. I'm Scott McReynolds and I live in Crypton, Kentucky. I'm the executive director of the Housing Development Alliance, which is a nonprofit that serves four counties uh, around housing issues. And we've repaired about 650 houses in the Kentucky Power area for low and very low income residents. And these are many of these low income uh, and homeowners have really high electric bills. And I'm deeply concerned about the impact that this rate increase is going to have on those homeowners and the other homeowner low income and moderate in households. It's important to remember that we're a high need area. And what I mean by that is 42% of the households in the four counties I serve, and a, a, a Kentucky Power Service Area is very similar to those four. All four are in Kentucky Service Power. 42% of those households live on less than $2,100 a month. One in six households, not people, but one in six households live on less than $1,000 a month income. So when you start talking about $20, $30, $40, $50 a month increases, it's significant. We often see bills, three, four, five hundred dollars a month electric bills for some of these families. They can't stand a 15% increase. And as Mayor Wolf pointed out, what lands up happening is they turn their electric heat off and turn to dangerous alternative heat. I'm additionally, I'm deeply concerned about the impact this is going to have on small businesses like the one I run. Senator Smith pointed out the challenging economic times. A lot of businesses are on the brink of survival. I'm particularly concerned about those businesses that are currently getting small general service that are going to be kicked to a new category, general service, and now be facing demand charges. This is something new and it's really impossible to know just how big impact this is going to have on small businesses. But the demand charges are going to particularly hit churches, uh, volunteer fire departments, community centers, and those sorts of services are going to be faced with significant increase because of that change. As you consider what uh, rate increase to approve, uh, I hope you take these considerations, these facts into consideration. Thank you. Gwen Christian. Joshua Bills.
Thank you, Public Service Commissioners, Chair, Vice Chair. I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak on behalf of struggling enterprises in Eastern Kentucky. My name is Josh Bills. I don't live in Kentucky Power Service area myself, but I work for an organization, Mountain Association for Community Economic Development, that has an office in Hazard served by Kentucky Power as a medium general service customer. MUSID is a 40-year-old organization that supports economic development in the region. In particular, the work that I do is to help enterprises reduce energy costs through building reviews, energy assessments, identifying energy cost savings projects, and help with access to incentives like Kentucky Power Commercial Incentive Program, which can pay up to 50% of upgrade equipment costs, but is currently on hold since funds allocated are fully subscribed for the year. Contrast this to other utilities that even with single year budget overruns for their commercial DSM are still getting rebates with their three year allocation. If needed, Mesa offers simple financing if upfront cost is a hurdle to an enterprise for accessing the savings and implementing energy efficiency that uh, implementing energy efficiency can provide. A billing evaluation reflecting what Kentucky Power originally proposed impacts our own hazard office with an annual cost increase of 39%. This results from proposed raising of monthly service fee by 29%, a volumetric charge, this is the price we pay per kilowatt hour of 11%, but the big kicker is, as Scott McReynolds had mentioned, raising the demand charge per kilowatt. And for medium general service, that is a 410% increase from $1.91 per kilowatt to $7.81 per kilowatt. Uh, show of hands, does anybody know what a demand charge is? And we'll keep the Kentucky Power folks out of it. Is that, is that it? Okay, so demand charge, you know, we're charged for the energy we use. Think of that as a bucket of water. Think of the hose filling up that bucket each month. And think of the flow out of that hose as your demand. The maximum flow, that would be your peak demand. So if you happen to be uh, perking a pot of coffee, when that 15-minute peak happens, that's an extra $12 on your bill at their proposed KW rate. If your water heater kicked on at that 15 minutes of your peak use, that's over $40 increase on your bill. So uh, you heard a lot in Prestonsburg last week and here tonight about how Kentucky Power should strap its belt, particularly at the corporate level and share some of the burden experienced by those that live and work or are looking for work in Eastern Kentucky. You've also heard about the disconnect between Kentucky Power investors and what it's like to live and work or be looking for work in the region. And you've also heard about the need for basic no frills electricity. What I'd like to highlight tonight is the particular insidious way that Kentucky Power is proposing to increase this revenue on the backs of small enterprises. These Kentucky Power customers include, as Scott had said, community centers, volunteer fire departments, church, churches, mission-based organizations, including those focused on helping residents pay their power bill. If this proposal goes through, as was originally proposed, along with medium general service, small general service customers will see their monthly service fee go up 29%, the kilowatt hour, kilowatt hour charge go up about 12%. Uh, but the name in the coffin, however, is for small general service customers is this new demand charge that will show up on their bill, a charge that has never, they have never experienced before and will be challenged to be able to respond to in a way that can reduce their cost. Any small general service customer with an electric water heater now has a new charge on their bill that can add over $40 each month on top of an increased monthly service fee and increased kilowatt hour rate. For a customer class with a median bill of 73.61 cents, this is a terrifying proposition. Uh, what is particularly insidious about this application of proposed rates? Well, we've looked at the meters that serve small enterprises and we believe Kentucky Power will need to invest in new meters for these customers just to be able to quantify and charge a demand charge. Quite the opposite of tightening up the bill. Based on rudimentary conservative estimate of demand for a number of small general service customer clients of ours, we're estimating cost increases for these small general service customers of 75% up to 100%. Much, much more than the 8.75% impact, quote, for illustrative purposes only that Kentucky Power suggests in its original public notice. 
Why is it for illustrative purposes? Sure, there is the ending of the service combining small general service and medium general service into a new general service, but I'm concerned that they can't even define the impact because the demand component, component isn't even currently being measured. It's mixed in with the demand contribution of other customers, like residences that are also not measured for demand. So small enterprises are the lifeblood for small rural communities in Kentucky Power Service Area. Overall, this proposal puts further stress on an already struggling region and should be denied, but in particular, the rate structure rollout puts unbelievable burden on the smallest of electric users. Kentucky Power suggests that one reason for the increase in reduced consumption, and as such, we should expect plenty of capacity to be available in an infrastructure of wires that is experiencing reduced con congestion, and as such, increasing demand charge would seem to be the least reasonable place to put additional charges if such charges are justified. Demand charges, second only to monthly service charge, is the hardest charge for customers to respond to in ways to reduce their costs and is the last place, if any exist, to apply such drastically weighted increases. Such an impl implementation will kill small businesses, services, and mission-based organizations in Eastern Kentucky. Thank you. Seth Long. Commissioners, thank you for uh, coming to Hazard tonight to hear what we had to say. A lot of concerns that we've had or I've had have already been expressed. Um, my name is Seth Long, the Executive Director of Homes Inc., 65 Bentley Avenue, Whitesburg, Kentucky. We're a small nonprofit organization dealing with housing issues. Um, we work hard helping people. We want to come tonight to represent many of the people that we represent, uh, low and very low income and moderate income homeowners. Um, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to articulate what all of our concerns are. Some of my concerns start at homes, our organization providing necessary and needed services in our service area. We have 10 commercial meters and what a previous speaker mentioned about the demand charges had me very concerned. I think the PSC needs to understand the implications of what these charges can do to a small business. There are many small business owners represented here tonight. I have a good friend who is here tonight, owns a small grocery store in a small town. She went out of her way and impressed the socks off me by doing amazing energy efficiency renovations to our grocery store. LED lighting, new cases, recapturing heat that was being wasted while she was, was um, throwing it out the window. Put a lot of money into it, yet with these new increases that are proposed, $8,000 increase over next year is what is calculated to be her increase. This is difficult on small, struggling businesses in our area. I also want to mention about the homeowners. Many of the people that we work for, that we help, we focus on energy efficiencies, cutting edge technology, bringing it to people, helping them to save energy. Many of these people in our region, there's a disproportionate amount of people that own their own homes that are low income in our neck of the woods. But yet they pay a disproportionately higher amount than many of the rest of us do because of the conditions of these homes. And as we're out here working to fix up the whole old homes, making them energy efficient, as we're out here building new houses, making them very excessively energy efficient, uh, I hear tonight a disconnect. Usage is down. Profits are down. So rates need to go up. Where's the incentive for us to save? Where's the incentive for us to go out and invest back into our businesses, into our houses? We, we do that. Usage goes down, but our rates go up. What's going on? That's what I don't understand. 
That proposal does not seem to me to be fair, just, or reasonable. That's not reasonable at all. I think these things, as you have heard tonight, need to be taken into consideration. And we appreciate you hearing us. Thank you. Jeff Lutz. Bill Pollard. Yeah. Tonita Goodwin. Timothy Kelly. A couple things I'd like to add to it. I'm Tim Kelly. I'm a concerned retired fellow. You're on Social Security. You all know, saying that they want a $20 increase. That's about what our check's going to be, 2%. They want 15%. <clears throat> and by the time everybody gets through going in on the rate increases, we're looking at about $100 extra on a year, not including the Obamacare raise. That's astronomical. I don't see how we can afford anything more on there. Matter of fact, I'm like a couple of others that was up here. We've been so good in the past about paying our bills, they ought to look at a rate decrease till we can all get on our feet real good. So that's what I'm asking the commission to go back to. Tell them that the people's hurting in these areas. They need a rate decrease, not an increase. Let's use a little bit of their... Let's, let's use a little bit of their $11 million dollars that they draw and put it back in to the people that give it to them in the first place. Also, they want a 15% increase. We only get a 2%. Where does it stop? Because the time you had to rest on, we can't even afford to buy our insulin, medicine. And that's mostly what I have to say. Everybody else has put some of the figures out there, and this is something that I wanted to mention. Douglas Bryant. Commissioner Smith, uh, Commissioner Cicero, Commissioner Matthew, thank you for coming to Hazard to listen to us about our concerns. My name is Douglas Bryant. I live at 47 Rainbow Lane, busy Kentucky, here in Perry County. And no, I haven't found a pot of gold, or I would be here tonight. But um, seriously, um, I, let me say first that the people who this rate increase is going to affect the most, uh, affects all of us, but the ones that will hurt the most are probably not even here tonight. And that's the elderly on fixed incomes. And these people choose between food, medicine, or power right now. And I know we've heard this over and over, and you've heard some realistic stories. It's not, it's not made up. It's true. And they choose between heat and electricity, food, and medicine. So what's, what's the choice? That's a tough choice. I'm also the a pastor of Solid Rock Fellowship here in Hazard. And just yesterday, we had, we had a family of six drive up to our building. I was preaching, and they knocked on the back door. They came in. Well, they came in the door. And then they left. My wife and my son went out to see what was going on. And uh, after the service, we found out that they, they had, he had lost his job. And they, he was begging for food for his four children. So we went and got him food, and we fed him. And we told him to come back, and we would feed him again. There's people hurting. It, it's real stories. It's not, it's, this is not made up. This is, not, this is real, real life. And Kentucky Power says the drop in customers, residential 2,450, commercial, that's the reason for this increase, right? Is that correct? I guess it is. I'm going to answer my own question. Um, but it's interesting. I did a little research while I was sitting and waiting uh, earlier today at lunch. And uh, it, it says that another investor-owned electric company utility, which there's four investor-owned utility companies named Duke Energy, and Kentucky Power is pretty, pretty similar in customer numbers, and they're very similar 
In 2013, 2016, this is on your own website, by the way. That's where I got it from. Uh, you all might want to take a look at it before you make this decision. It's interesting. Duke, uh, their, their electric bills in 2013 was $40, $41 less than Kentucky Power. 2014, it was $51 less than Kentucky Power. 2015, it was $43 less. And in 2016, it was $67. The average electric power bill, residential that is, was $67 less. At the same time, Duke's population, number of customers, was 19,000 more than Kentucky Power. So, and 16,000 in 2014. 15,000 more in 2015. 14,000 more in 2016. So, you know, I don't, I don't understand the logic. Maybe I'm reading the numbers wrong. I used to be a math teacher, but it looks to me like that Duke, Duke Energy has got less customers, but yet their, their average uh, bill for their customers is $67 less. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know what the deal is. You know. Uh, you know. I, I, I'm passionate about this because uh, I am not elected official. I am going to run for magistrate. I wish I would have stepped up as elected official because I could be home in bed <laughs> and I could be uh, getting ready for work in the morning. But anyway, uh, so why do they need to increase? Why do they need to increase? They've already mentioned 11 million dollars. You know, I know CEOs make a lot of money. A lot of CEOs make a lot of money. And I'm not against these guys that are local. I'm not. They work their tails off to keep our power running. I appreciate that. They do. They get out and work their tails off. But the workers do. And that's what's wrong with this whole country. Since 1970, there's been a 257% increase in what the CEOs make and what the common workers make. That's the problem. There's only one company in America, the SAS, that actually their, their uh, CEOs make about 60% less. You know what? There's people dying to get jobs there because they treat their employees right. They have, they have nurse care, nursing care for their children. They don't have to bring their kids with them. They have those programs. They treat their customers right. It goes back, it goes back to, you know, we're not, we're not all dumb here. It goes back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. The love of money is the root of all evil. This is all about greed. And this is all about greed. That's what it's about. Plain and simple. And you can say you care about people, but until you do something about it, I don't know if you care or not. Your actions do speak louder than words. So I'm asking you, they had, I told you a minute ago, I, well, I told the guy that was giving us the information, um, AEP's uh, stock market went up from, I got you, went up from, I'm almost done. I am a preacher, though. I'm almost done. When I say almost done, that, that means another hour. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, seriously, I respect you. But anyway, uh, their average increase went from $29.24 to the day at 4.08 p.m. I mean, you can check this on the Internet, $73.73. That's a 252% stock increase. I don't think they need more money. Do you? As a teacher, I didn't get a raise the last six years I taught. The last six years, I didn't get a raise. I made it. With all the increases. We are, we the people, it's your job, it's your job to protect us. This is a monopoly. I don't care what you say, it's a monopoly. The only choice we got power is Kentucky Power. I, I can go to Lowe's and buy food. I mean, not Lowe's. Well, Lowe's is a store in the south. My brother works for MDI, so it is a food store, in case y'all didn't know. But anyway, I can go to Food City, I can go to Walmart, I can go to my local grocery, and if their prices are too high, you know what I can do? I can go to the other one. And I have a choice. I have a choice. I don't have a choice on power. These elderly people don't have a choice on power. They either snuggle up, I mean, I mean now some people can't even realize that. That's why I'm running for magistrate, because I know I can't do anything about Washington. I really can't, other than vote. I can't do much about the Kentucky government, but I can do something locally, and that's why I'm running for magistrate. But anyway, beyond that, if one is too high, we can choose the other store, like I said. My question is, when is it enough? I, I did research. This commission, this commission is supposed to be who protects us from a monopoly and from people who are just greedy. And it is just greed. That's all it is, plain and simple. Thank you very much.
Gwen Johnson. Hello, I'm Gwen Johnson. I, work, I live at uh, 2738 Highway 317 in Jackhorn, Kentucky, and I'm here on behalf of Hempfield Community Center. Um, when Josh Bills was up here a while ago, um, he, he told you a little bit about uh, why I stayed here uh, tonight to talk to you. Uh, that demand charge uh, per kilowatt hour is currently uh, $1.91 on our uh, community center's uh, electric bill. If the rate increase happens as they have proposed, that demand charge is $7.84 per kilowatt hour. And what that will mean for us is um, we, we have tried to shoulder some of the load that happened um, when uh, that was left without anybody to shoulder it when the coal severance tax money ran out and the county shut down the senior citizen seniors. And so our seniors still wanted to meet and they meet at our facility and they're cooking their own meal and they're uh, doing their own setup and they're doing their own cleaning and they're having a wonderful time. But if this electric bill increase happens, they won't even be able to do that because we won't have any place to house them. We house um, the homeschooling um, Association in Letcher County. Um, they call themselves Apple. They are Appalachian parents providing loving education. That's what that um, acronym stands for. And all their so uh, socialization activities, um, sometimes proms, graduations, science fairs, that sort of thing happens at our facility. Um, we have a martial, martial arts classes going on. They're free to the public. Uh, the children frequent them. We have music events um, for the public and a large number of our seniors frequent those events. And we are not going to be able to provide our outreach. We are a 501c3 um, under the IRS as a charitable organization. But if uh, Kentucky Paris succeeds in gaining this increase that they're requesting, um, our charity days are over because we will have to shut our doors. We will not be able to provide the outreach and the services that we have been struggling so hard to provide. The electric bill has always been the biggest strain on the finances that we could have done outreach with. And we've had to shoulder that load. In the wintertime, the power bill at that facility under the present charges is about eight hundred to a thousand dollars a month and we pay that during the winter we keep everything when it, the building's not on in use we keep the thermostat cut down to about 50 degrees enough to keep the pipes from freezing and then um, we just heat it up as we need it for activities or whatever's going on there but um, if this increase happens, we won't be able to do it. Um, and so I'm asking you all uh, to protect us from this and protect the work that we are striving to do. Um, the outreach to the poor and the outreach to the elderly and the activities for the children that are so desperately needed and public spaces that people can meet publicly. We provide a meeting space for people who want to have public meetings. Um, and, you know, and we don't charge them for that. We are housed in a, a building that is owned by the fiscal court, but we are autonomous in our, uh, they don't charge us any rent, but we have to pay the utilities on that building. And the electric bill has always, it's, I mean, we make our money from food usually from cakes and pies and uh, little music events and this and that to try to do our outreach. I mean, 
when you when you think of the increase, um, let me find it here. Overall, our bill is expected to rise 77% with a yearly increase of approximately $3,863. Now that's going to be too many cakes and pies. We won't be able to do it. There's no way we can do it. And you all, I'm expecting you all to help us. I'm imploring you to help us. Help us to help the poor and the elderly and the children. Last roll. I have no indoor voice, so this may be as close as you really want me to the mic. Um, good evening, you guys. My name is Les Roll, and I live here in Perry County on Kentucky Boulevard in Hazard. I actually live about across the river from the AEP offices here. Um, I work for the Mountain Association for Community Economic Development, supporting entrepreneurs and small businesses across 14 counties. From the personal perspective, I oppose this proposed rate increase. My wife is a school teacher. I work in economic development. Good jobs, but not high paying ones. Paying a 15% increase in our electric costs would be a burden to us and our ability to provide a comfortable life for our son. For many of my neighbors who face that burden without the benefit of stable dual incomes, that is a significant burden and one that concerns me. Professionally, I know that cost increases for commercial accounts means a few things. Business is not started, jobs lost, and higher product and service costs for our community. Every day I work with folks who want to start businesses or have businesses in this area. It's hard. Starting a business in Eastern Kentucky is hard. These electric cost increases have the effect of moving the goalposts for entrepreneurs, making it more difficult for them to be successful in a market that is already difficult. These increases will have the effect of discouraging entrepreneurs and new businesses. The impacts on the smallest businesses, those on the SGS rate class, expected to pay a new demand charge will be chilling and I expect some of them will close. If businesses, excuse me, if businesses don't close but struggle as they will under these proposed increases, they'll need to cut other costs and, reduce, and increase revenues. Cutting costs means reducing employee costs, eliminating shift hours, reducing wages, and laying people off. Increasing revenue means getting an already strapped community to increase spending, hard to do before they face their own residential electric cost increases. Let's face it, it's hard to get blood from a turnip, much less one that's already been wrung dry before you got to it. A commercial client of mine had to leave earlier today, and uh, he manages 12 grocery stores across this region. One of his local stores is projected to see increases of $25,000 a year under the proposed rate increases. Grocery stores operate on a tight margin, so tight that they would need to increase sales by more than $80,000 a year to make up for that difference. I appreciate the work that Kentucky Power does. I really enjoy having electricity. Hot water on demand is a glorious thing. And I understand that it costs money to have that. Um, but I cannot support these proposed rate increases and changes because they will have a significant and deleterious effect on our families, in our communities, and on our businesses. Kentucky Power has an obligation to its shareholders, and I understand that. But I have an obligation to my family and my neighbors. Without this increase, Kentucky Power will still meet some measure of obligation to their shareholders. If the PSC allows this increase, the obligations we have to our families and our communities may not be met at all. Thank you for your time. Trey Zimmerman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Satterwhite, how are you? Uh, the reason why we're here is started in 2009. 
the country elected a man that we thought was going to do something, but instead he destroyed yes. our Eastern Kentucky. Yes, and as a result of that, Mr. Satterwhite's company believed that the entire energy mix was going to change. So his company then made the egregious mistake of destroying the power plant that served this area and provided hundreds of jobs. Now, I met Mr. Satterwhite a year ago over at Hazard Community College and we had a spirited discussion. But out of that, he said something that made a lot of sense to me. I want to create jobs in Eastern Kentucky. I said, that's fantastic. And you know what? I've got the solution to that. Unfortunately, we haven't gone anywhere with it since. Now my, and I introduced him to the people that has done something that's quite remarkable. They built a power plant over in Martin County. They used municipal solid waste. These were two coal guys that, that got inspired about, what, about low energy costs. So my idea was for, to uh, partner with them and to uh, take the 34 counties that are in eastern Kentucky who have been absolutely decimated because no severance tax coming in and have them as the base to provide the fuel to build this power plant, that, uh, a, a large one, a 48 megawatt power plant. Well, we never really got anywhere with them. So what we've decided to do is to go ahead without them. And we're going to look at building a power plant here in eastern Kentucky and one in western Kentucky and, in fact, all across the United States because we have people that believe in low-cost energy and taking care of municipal solid waste. Now, my idea was to build a power plant right out here at the industrial uh, plant. And from that, all of the 34 counties would then be able to bring their trash there and they would get a return on their investment in the trash that they did because they're low, they would have lower costs, because the 48 megawatt power plant will power 48,000 homes. Okay? Now, my second idea was to say, oh, let's make this an ec economic zone where we will take, we'll partner with the SBA and bring in set-aside contracts, 30-year contracts, and bring in 5,000 or maybe 10,000 employees up uh, into this, uh, uh, industrial park with anywhere from 10, 15, 20 companies that would love to have people care about them. Amen. And how many jobs would that do? Now, we would love to partner with AEP on this, but for some reason, it just, it just didn't work. So we're partnering with some other people that believe in our idea and we're going to do something with this. So if we can provide an alternative to you to get lower costs, because think about this, if we're able to power steam into these different plants that have 30-year contracts with the federal government, what is that, you know, for every job created by something like that, it creates four additional jobs. Let's we'll say there's 5,000 jobs out there. That creates 20,000 jobs. Now, I don't care about beating up on these people because it's not their fault. This happened because of the Obama administration. That's why we're here. Let's call it like it is. You know, the Democrats said, y'all blown it. The, the, the thing that gets me is, is this Democrat Party is not like the, the Kennedy Party of when I was growing up as a kid. I recognize it. They don't want jobs. That's the good paying jobs is the only thing that counts. That pays for all the social programs that people want. And then who cares what the electric bill is if you've got enough money coming in? Who cares? Thanks. Charlene Bentley. <coughs> I'm 
Charlene Bentley from Trace Taney Road in Fifth Passes. Most of my concerns have already been voiced, so I'll just add a couple comments. One um, is that um, some people have made suggestions about Kentucky Power and APs being more efficient in their business practices, and uh, several of those I had already considered. So, but one that has not been mentioned is this letter that we get telling us how our homes compare in, with other homes in efficiency. Yeah. Uh, it, I'm, it's probably trivial in the grand scheme of company expenses, but it annoys me no end <laughs> uh, when I get it. And I think a lot of people feel the same way. And many of us know that small amounts add up to make large numbers when you're dealing with large numbers of customers. Uh, and I still, I would not want the job of the man who spoke earlier giving us the background information at all. I, I feel sorry for him. But I'm still trying to figure out how, when there's a sporting event that Kentucky Power sponsors, um, that it is paid for by the shareholders instead of the rate payers. Because ultimately, the funds come from the rate payers, it seems. Um, the other thing, my final point, is that um, I did, as many people have done, uh, did a little research, and I came across um, end-of-the-year statements of income for Kentucky Power Company, not AEP, but just Kentucky Power Company, for the last three years. And um, it doesn't call it profits at the end of the, the statement. It has revenues and then expenses that are, are subtracted. Uh, you get down to the bottom line, you end up with either net income or the further bottom line, total comprehensive income. And it's interesting that for the year 2014, that number was 37,770,000. For 2015, it dropped by a considerable amount to 27,400, I mean 27,496,000. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned that their last rate increase was June of 2015. Because it's remarkable what happened to this bottom line in 2016. It went up to 50,000, I mean 50 million, 501,000 from 27 million, 496,000 the year before. And that boggles my mind that a company whose bottom line increases that much, and almost certainly on the backs of the average people that we've heard about all evening, is asking for even more. It really does. And I do appreciate your, your willingness to listen to us, and I ask for your fairness in making this difficult decision. Thank you. <clears throat> Jerry Utt. Tony Vaughn. Helen Brunty, John Hopp, Kevin Horn, Susan Brotherton, I think I'll speak for a moment. My name is Susan Brotherton, and I live here in Hazard. I live at 716 Kentucky Boulevard. I own a business, and it's a family business. It's been here 50 years. I'm also a Hazard City Commissioner. I should have said I was a politician about two hours ago. Uh, but anyway, most of the things that I feel everybody has said, five ways from none, we all are in agreement. But there are a couple things. All right. 
I googled when it was Kentucky Power founded. It was founded in 1919. I didn't know that until I sat back there. All right. Since 1919, I am sure they've had millions of increases. I own a store that was founded in 1967 by my father. Two years ago, I decided to remodel it and invest back in Hazard. I totally gutted it, tore the building down, went energy conscious, and I can't get my bill down because they got that demand thing on my bill. But I decided to invest in Hazard and Eastern Kentucky. I, I'm not making as much salary, but I've got more employees. Kentucky Power might be here for the long run, and they might want to say, let's not do a rate increase. Let's invest back in Eastern Kentucky. Let's help these people. I didn't take a penny for a year out of my store. We lived on my husband's police pension. But I got a store that's gorgeous and I'm making more money today. They might make more money in the long run than they will ever make sucking Eastern Kentucky dry. That's most of what I have to say. And uh, Besides, do you all also um, consider the trickle effect? Besides, this rate increase is going to drastically raise business. Well, all these businesses are going to raise what these people pay. These kids, a box is going to cost them $2 instead of $1.50. You know what I'm saying? Your utilities, I'm a commissioner, our utilities will go up. Everything will go up. This rate increase affects the way of life of everybody in a town and every business. Do you weigh that in as much as you weigh in every other aspect? Does that make sense? Please, really consider all of this before you make this decision. I'm having difficulty reading this last name, but it's Jonathan Hostman, Hootman, I'm not here. Saved by the bell. Hmm? I saved. <laughs> Scott, Scott Wagonast, AARP. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. I'm Scott Wagonist again with AARP Kentucky. I'm the Associate State Director for Advocacy and Outreach. Uh, we are housed in Louisville. Uh, my responsibility is the 5th Congressional District and the 6th Congressional District for our 470,000 AARP Kentucky members. And the reason that I am here tonight, as I was in uh, Perry, in, uh, I'm sorry, in Prestonsburg, um, I, tonight, I am able to deliver 100 more petitions to the Commission that we have collected online from Kentucky uh, Electric, Kentucky Power customers that are opposed to the rate, rate increase. Across the country, this is pretty common for ARP to scrutinize this type of case and offer our, our opinion in these matters. Um, and fundamentally, the short to shorten my comments down, which I had submitted in uh, Prestonsburg, but we just think this is an inordinate, unfair rate increase for residential customers. Kentucky Power proposes, uh, the proposal includes a 16% increase to residential customers, while other customers are faced with an increase about half that size. And half of the increase is primarily saddled on residential customers. Many of Kentucky Public, uh, Kentucky Power Company's aging customers, especially in Eastern Kentucky, are already struggling to make ends meet. And as you've noted and you've heard tonight, the Social Security cost of living adjustment will only be some 2% um, in the next year. And this is no way an offset um, for an unexpected jump in their home energy cost. Um, most importantly, the the rate increase is simply too high, and we, at, we urge the Public Service Commission to give it close scrutiny. Um, because when you owe Kentucky Power 
1750, even before you turn your lights on, um, we believe that this is um, an, an incredibly difficult way to manage your energy bill, and it's going to primarily harm uh, low income and fixed income users. You've heard that uh, Kentucky Power Company resident uh, customers will already owe more than Duke Energy and LG&E and KU customers. Um, one point that I didn't make in Prestonsburg that I wanted to reiterate here is ARP opposes special surcharges of any type. Um, such flow through spending trackers and single issue rate making where there is no opportunity to consider offsetting cost reductions uh, by the Kentucky Public Service Commission. So let me just thank you again for being um, here in Hazard and your next hearing in Ashland and we hope to uh, see you again in Ashland and we do urge you to reject the Kentucky power rate increase. So thank you. John Short. Thank you. My name is John Short, uh, 240 Briarwood Lane, Mally, Kentucky. I'm a former legislator. Uh, Fitz Steele and I were both. We was one, two or three of us really stayed on AEP's back wanting them to be fair to Eastern Kentucky. Well, we're no longer in the legislature. AEP donated the maximum amount that they could donate to our opposition to make sure that we would not return. I know I know some faces over here I still know. Greg Polly, which was one of the CEOs, one time took come to a committee meeting and called our floor leader, Representative Rock Yakin, one of the most honorable men I've known in my life, a liar right to his face in committee. Well, he got to where he wasn't welcome in Franklin, so I guess that's might have been one of the reasons he retired. But he called Rocky a liar to his face right in committee. And when he got done doing that, I told him, I said, sir, if you ever come to Frankfurt again and call my majority floor leader a liar, you and I will walk outside and we'll discuss this privately. Uh, but I know that's, that's all in the past. Like I say, they donated the maximum amount they could to beat us just because that way they wouldn't have nobody in Frankfurt chewing on their ears every time they come to Frankfurt. But I know y'all don't have anything to do with the past approval of the rate increases. And I hope you really listen to us because the past PSC apparently is in the back pockets of AEP or somebody like that because they were never denied a rate increase. All right. I hope y'all have the backbone to stand up to any entity or corporation that tries to screw Eastern Kentucky like AEP has tried to screw us. I mean, the people, the men and women that put their work boots on every day for AEP, I'd put them against anybody in the United States. I mean, they're great. They're out three or four o'clock morning if our power goes off. But I want y'all to look at some of the, and make, what'd be nice if y'all make AEP stand up and pay for some of the bad decisions they made instead of making us pay for their bad decisions. All right, y'all, well, y'all did. The past PSC made us pay for half of the Mitchell Power Plant. I know they had their reasons. All right, just think, if they wouldn't have tore down the big Sandy Power Plant, if they wouldn't have turned the other power plant into natural gas, right now, they could still be using our coal, burning our coal in their power plant. If they was burning our coal, we'd still have our jobs. Yes. But no, they made bad decisions. They wanted to do this. And you know what happened? It didn't cost them nothing. They just threw another 50, 75 bucks on each one of our backs per month on our power bill. They don't care. But right now, our unemployment, like I used to represent McGough County, their unemployment's like 18%. I mean, it's unreal. <coughs> and they're still wanting us to pay for their bad decisions. Is there any way that y'all can make them pay for all the rate increases or at least reimburse us for the rate increases on the decisions they made that affected us that if they wouldn't have made them decisions, 
none of this would have ever happened. You know, I own a gun shop in Lock County, and the last month I've took over 100 guns to an auction just trying to stay open. I mean, it's that bad in eastern Kentucky. I take, took 20 to Lawrenceburg. I've taken over 80 to Corinth. It's booming up in them places. Like, right now, the people here are pawning me their guns. They can't afford to come pick them up. You know the main reason that they come to my pawn shop and want to pawn guns or gold or whatever is to pay their electric bill. That's all I ever hear is electric bill, $600, $700. They don't draw $1,000 a month. Man. They get food stamps. They'll get some subsidies. But they've got three or four kids at home. Their kids deserve to go to McDonald's and eat and play the same as mine would. They don't have to be penalized because they can't they say, well, we can't go to the McDonald's because we don't have the money. We've got to pay our electric bill next week. Uh, are there any other utilities in Kentucky that require or request rate increases as often as AEP does? I can answer that for you. They don't because I was chairman of Tourism, Development, and Energy. As soon as I become chairman, I requested all this information. I'm not going to say his name, but the previous PSC chairman would not come to my committee because he knew I'd chew his ears off. So, with stuff like that, you know, the fiscal courts right now, they have to raise taxes on the people here because they don't have coach severance. You hear the judges say that. But if they don't do something, the state will come in, shut us down, and take over. And that's, we don't want that. We, we can't afford new taxes, but we can't afford for the state to come in and take us over either. And all I ask for you all is to have the backbone to stand up to AEP and other entities in Kentucky and tell them, no, this is not fair, you don't need it. I'd like to say, when Greg probably come and called Rocky Atkins a liar committee, I'm sure he was wanting his million dollar bonus. That's the main reason he come there. But until you all get the backbone to stand up and say no to these people, we're, Kentucky's going to have to go to electing the PSC instead of having it appointed from the governor. And, I, and I'm just, and I'm sure you've heard it before. But until you all have to start answering to us, what can we do? If, we, if you know that you're going to get voted out, if you make this bad decision that you probably will make because they've never been turned down before in their life, but if you knew that you was going to get beat for making that decision, I promise you, you'd change your mind. Thank you. Scott Frazier. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Scott Frazier. I'm not a, uh, a resident of the Kentucky Power Service area, but um, I grew up in the Kentucky Power Service area. I live in Winchester, Kentucky at 229 East Broadway, and I'm the statewide donor relations officer for the American Red Cross. And we've heard them referenced earlier tonight when Mayor Wolf mentioned um, the 14 fires that she you know, gets up and goes and visits with the families. And, um, as, and she does that as a volunteer for us. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself to give you some perspective. And then I'm going to tell you some things you probably don't know about these fine folks from Kentucky Power. So, you know, I'm, I'm 46, almost 47 years old. My father worked for National Mine Service Company. My grandfather and both my uncles worked for Armco Steel. Every one of their jobs and every one of the jobs and every man in my family was related to coal. And during the 80s, I went to the Union Hall on Saturdays, sat and listened to Dad make calls as the Union Secretary while I was watching Happy Days, and he's calling and, and getting vendors to not service the scabs. I spent many a, a, a winter's night, week night, summer night on the picket lines. And economic hardship is nothing new to Eastern Kentucky. Uh, all these problems that we're having, they're no surprise. This stuff's been going on for decades. And it's decades of bad decisions being made inside Kentucky for Kentucky and bad decisions being made outside Kentucky for Kentucky. And what, what particularly bothers me is that we have a good, viable,
company here in Kentucky, in Kentucky Power, that provides a vital service to the men and women across their service area. And they want to stay economically viable. They don't want to become the next dissolved, used to be uh, an energy company. And, you know, they're here. They've chosen to place their headquarters in, in eastern Kentucky, in Ashland now. They've moved out of Frankfurt, and they're here. And I can tell you, as the relationship manager for this, um, this relationship between Red Cross and Kentucky Power, they do care, despite what is you know, some of the other things you may have heard here tonight. Um, they are compassionate people. You know, when, uh, one of our initiatives is a home fire campaign. Well, we go out and we go door to door. We've done it here in Hazard. We've done it in Pikeville. We've done it in just about every county seat in eastern Kentucky. I think we maybe have a handful of county seats in the 23 counties in the eastern Kentucky chapter. We haven't installed smoke alarms in. These folks put the work in with us. They, you know, they, Matthew was right out here in Hazard installing smoke alarms with our volunteers. Now, people want to talk about, you know, switching to cheaper sources of heat and that becoming dangerous. They recognize that. That's why they support our programs. They do save lives. You might say, well, you're spitting in the well. Well, we got 27 documented lives saved here in Kentucky through that program that they support. And every one of those families will say it was worth it and it wasn't just spitting in the well. So... In addition to that, we've heard a lot of talk about AEP, and there's there are shareholders, and um, well, their shareholders support a foundation that does tremendous goodwill in communities that, that where they exist, whether it be through economic development grants or or what have you, but here in Eastern Kentucky specifically, the Red Cross folks, we've been here a hundred years doing this. Since, since the boys came home from World War I, that's when we started doing what we did. And it started with the nursing corps, and it developed into all kinds of good programs that benefit people of the Commonwealth in eastern Kentucky, where there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of need. We've never had an emergency response vehicle of our own in all of eastern Kentucky in 100 years. Isn't that pretty preposterous, given the amount of natural disasters we've suffered? Well, you want to know what company said? We'll fill that hole, Kentucky Power. It came right out of their stockholders' foundation. Their shareholders have to fill that foundation. They could have sent that money anywhere, right? You could have supported any program. But they decided to support a program that's going to make a tremendous amount of difference here in eastern Kentucky. It's a $150,000 grant. And that vehicle will serve any family in Kentucky that's been affected by a fire and been burned out. It's going to be here when the floods come in the spring. And it's going to be, you know, when we had the fire here at the Hotel in Hazard, we didn't have a vehicle to come down and set up and feed meals to these people. Thanks to them, we do now. It'll be here in March or April. So, <clears throat> I know these folks. Matthew, Jacob, Dale. Allison, I know them on a personal level. And there have been some good things said about those folks tonight, but not near enough. And so <clears throat> when people want to uh, make the case that it's all about greed and they really don't care about Kentucky, well, I know firsthand it's not the case. They could have supported any number of measures. And I'm out there pushing this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. I've visited nearly every county judge executive in eastern Kentucky. As a fundraiser, I know what companies are successful and profitable and what aren't. And what counties are successful and profitable and are keeping their books up and, and have money to spend and which ones don't. Clay and Wolf County support our programs, but some of the wealthiest counties in eastern Kentucky won't because they recognize what's important the same way these folks do. And so, now I don't really have a position on this rate increase. But I can tell you, Kentucky Power is a good corporate citizen. They care about Eastern Kentucky. And if we're lucky, they'll be here for a while. Maybe another 98 years. You said he started in 1919. If we're lucky, they'll be here for that much longer. If we're not lucky, they'll dissolve, become someone else. Your 
your rate increase, you'll be paying into some kind of co-op and it'll be even worse. So keep, keep those things in mind. And, and keep in mind that these folks are your neighbors. They're Eastern Kentuckians. They're wanting the same things out of life that we all want. And that's all I have to say. That, uh, with Mr. Frazier, concludes everyone who has signed up. Unless there is someone else who signed up and it didn't make it on the sheet or someone who didn't sign up but would like to speak now anyway. Uh, if you do, please come forward and identify yourself and, and uh, tell us what you'd like. Hello, my name is James Fisher. I live at 267 Tip Road in Letcher County. Um, I could tell you just another sad story of how the coal, war on coal has hurt my family and we can't afford it. But uh, one thing I haven't noticed is nobody has mentioned anything about how the deception in the billing is going to take place with this proposal. Um, they want to take the riders off of the billing so that you don't see it every time you open the bill and get angry with them every time you look at the bill, put it right in the rate increase. If nothing else, you should turn this rate increase down just for deceptive billing. I mean, uh, they're, they're, they're tired of trying to answer, because everybody, every time somebody calls and wants to ask about why is this rider on here, they want to get rid of that, so they get rid of the calls. They're trying to be deceptive to the public, to their customers, and it shouldn't be allowed. Um, last year, last, last January, I got a $1,000 electric bill. Just finally, because I had to get on a, uh, a budget, just finally, last month, got it paid off. Here it is, getting cold again. Pretty soon I'm going to owe another $1,000 bill. I'll have to get on that, and I'll be paying for the next six months on that. We cannot afford the rate increase. Uh, I mean, we, if anything, what you need to do is have a decrease because we are economically strapped in this community. We can't do it. Until jobs start coming back in, we're still paying for this. We're still fighting the war on coal. And until jobs start coming back in, we're not going to be able to do it. These fine folks are not going to lose their job if they don't get this rate increase. People may end up losing their houses if this rate increase goes through. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Anyone else like to speak? And Mr. Short, we got to... <laughs> I was going to tell the people around here, there's one thing y'all probably don't know. Uh, the past PSC approved, when they tore down the big sunny power plant, they magically act like this wore out, there was nothing left on them. Well, they magically, after they decided to tear it down, said, well, there's 25 years left in the big sunny power plant. So the past PSC approved for them over the next 25 years to get paid another 420 some million dollars it's going to be added on to our bill for the next 25 years for the life that was left on the wore out big sandy power plant. So if they wouldn't tore that down, like I said, right now we'd still be burning coal in them two wore out plants for the next 25 years apparently because magically they went from being wore out to all of a sudden, oh, we got all kinds of life left. Let's get another $424 million, I think, and add it on to the ratepayers for the next 25 years. Thank you. Okay, one more. Ma'am, just come. <laughs> this is the only time we're going to be here, so we want to make sure everybody can say whatever they want to say. I wanted to uh, respond to the gentleman who said we would be, maybe uh, if Kentucky Power disintegrated and we had to go to a co-op system, uh, we actually have a place that is serviced off by a co-op, and I had previously uh, figured up the total cost per kilowatt hour, including every charge on the Kentucky Power Bill and the bill from Cumberland Valley Electric Co-op. 
Uh, and it turns out that the, uh, bar the total price per kilowatt hour with all the charges and everything added from Kentucky Power is 13.5 cents per kilowatt hour. The charge from Cumberland Valley Electric, which is a co-op, is 11.2 cents per kilowatt hour. Thank you. <coughs> you, still you yes, I do. It's something I forgot. I'd like to address it, and sure. thank you for giving me that opportunity. My name. You don't need to go through it again. Freddie Coleman from <laughs> Pottsburg, Kentucky. Okay. Uh, I'd like to address the issue on Rockport One power plant in Rockport, Rockport, in Indiana. But uh, you no, know, Rockport is owned by Indiana and Michigan Power Plant, and they service the customers of Indiana and Michigan. I'd like to know what that has to do with the East Kentucky customers. You know, why should we buy environmental equipment for this plant? You no, know, for this Rockport One plant. Why should we? When, uh, when Kentucky Power or AP would not buy the I mean, the environmental equipment for the number two unit, which you know, at at Big Sandy, and also. Uh, also, we can't afford, afford no more because we are already paying for the Big Sandy Power Plant and we're paying for the Mitchell Power Plant and people cannot afford no more tariffs and stuff on our power bill. And it, it is not right. We cannot pay for, for cha uh, cha changes and remodeling every power plant that AEP has. You know, there's got to be a stop somewhere for it. And I, I think we're paying for enough. And I would thank you all if you all would stand up for us in this matter with Kentucky Power. And I thank you all for your time for being here. Okay, if there's... Ma'am, do you want to speak? No? <laughs> all right, if there's, if, there's, uh, if there's no one else wishes to speak, uh, appreciate your being here. We'll take everything that you've said, all your comments. Uh, into consideration in the case and uh, anyone here that has questions Kentucky Power people are here to answer your questions and uh, Mr. McNeil from the Attorney General's office is here uh, to answer any questions you may have of him as is the Public Service Commission staff. So with that uh, on behalf of my fellow commissioners and the Commission as a whole we appreciate your being here and uh, thank you very much and good night. <laughs>